Prophecy Club, a nationwide television program, a nationwide radio program. The Prophecy Club also hosts approximately 40 major city meetings per month. Our mission is to inform Christians of current events that confirm Bible prophecy, expose the evil devices of Satan, warn believers what is coming to America, challenge people to stop sinning and turn to Jesus with all their heart and to provide a platform for Christian speakers to be heard. It's a bald-faced lie. Using the positions of power and authority in our own government. The greatest oil field in the world is at the southwest end of the Dead Sea. He said, son, you must warn this nation. And now your host for the Prophecy Club, Stan Johnson. Welcome to the Prophecy Club, where we study and research Bible prophecy. Tonight's topic is Secrets of the Illuminati. Well, you're in for a treat because you're about to start understanding prophecy a lot better by understanding the history and the conspiracy that is pulling strings behind the scenes. Our speaker has spent 37 years researching the Illuminati. He's one of the world's leading authorities on Professor Carol Quigley, which is President Clinton's mentor. He'll present new information to help us better understand this world conspiracy. He's going to talk on things like the Federal Reserve, which is neither federal and has doubtful reserves. The Rhodes Scholar, which we are led to believe is a wonderful uh, academic achievement. And what they're really doing is quite evil. The Jesuits, the Lucius Trust, the Masons, Skull and Bones, Rosicrucians, Trilateral Commission, Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderbergers, and a whole lot more. Now, in many other videotapes, which is, by the way, part of our special, as you saw at the beginning the end of the videotape, we have other information uh, about these subjects. But what he's going to do tonight that is so powerful, he's going to weave this together in an overall picture to better help us understand this world conspiracy that has been going on since the dawn of time. Will you help me welcome Dr. Stan Monteith. One of the leading occult philosophers of all time was a man named Manly P. Hall. And in his classic book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, he said that you can trace the history and the presence uh, of the occult organizations throughout history by simply looking at pictures or looking at books or looking at woodcuts or uh, looking at architecture because uh, they use logos, they use symbols. Uh, their presence is very obvious to those within the inside. Uh, but tragically, most people, the average individual, has no knowledge of the presence of these dark and sinister spiritual forces. Now, I want to convince you of three things. The first is that an understanding of the forces that have shaped the events of the 20th century is predicated not upon facts to be learned, but rather upon secrets to be discovered. The second is that men and women become accomplices to those evils they fail to oppose. And third, uh, that the price that men and women pay for their apathy and indifference to public affairs is they are ruled by evil men. And I'd like to suggest today that we truly are ruled by evil men. Now, you'll be able to better understand uh, the background of the history I'm about to tell you uh, by reviewing three poems. The first was written by Albert Lord Tennyson in 1842. Uh, the second was written by Rudyard Kipling in 1902. Uh, and the third poem was written by James Russell Lowell uh, in the 1840s or 1850s. Now, the first two poems and their significance are known to those people who work behind the scenes, but not to the average individual. 
When we talk about Tennyson, most people remember his wonderful poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade. Uh, you know, cannons to the right of them, cannons to the left of them, cannons before them volleyed and thundered, stormed by shot and shell, bravely they rode and well, into the jaws of death, into the gates of hell, rode the 600. But the poem that shaped the events of the 20th century was called Locksley Hall. Now in my Encyclopedia Americana, they have a full page about a poem nobody ever heard of. But believe me, the people on the inside, those people who understand the unfolding of world events and are making them happen, understand the significance of this poem. And this is what Albert Alf Lord Tennyson wrote, what Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote. For I dipped into the future, far as any eye could see, saw a vision of the world and all the wonders that would be. Heard the heavens filled with shouting and the rain to ghastly dew of the nation's airy navies grappling in the central blue. Till the war drum throbbed no longer and the battle flags were furled in the parliament of man, the federation of the world. And that's what it was about. This idea of the parliament of man, the federation of the world, the establishment of a world government. Now the ideas that Tennyson put forward in this poem captured the imagination of subsequent generations of, of people. One of them, of course, was a professor uh, who would be teaching at Oxford University in 1870. His name was Professor John Ruskin. And, of course, this professor was a disciple of Plato, an avowed communist and socialist. Uh, and he thought this was a wonderful idea, and he passed this information on to many of his students. Students then were shaped the events that would occur in the early part of this century. Uh, Another man was a gentleman named Edward Bellamy. And Edward Bellamy wrote a book that was published in 1888 entitled Looking Backward. Now, uh, this was a fascinating book because it was no sooner published than Bellamy clubs sprang up all over Great Britain and all over the United States, pushing the socialist utopia uh, that he described. And basically, this is a story uh, of an Englishman who fell asleep in 1887, 1888, I guess it was, and, and slept until the year 2000. He took a sedative. It was very effective. He woke up in the year 2000, and he be, described what the world would be like in that world that we are approaching and approaching very, very rapidly. And he commented at that time that an American credit card will be just as good in Europe as uh, gold once was. Now, remember, this was written 111 years ago today at the present time. 111 years ago, uh, Bellamy knew what the future held. Could you imagine people, at the, even at the turn of the century or in the 50s, saying an American credit card will be just as good in Europe as gold once was? Uh, he described what had happened is that the corporations kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, and the corporations began absorbing other corpor corporations until there was just a great trust that ruled everything. The great trust and government, the great corporation and the government controlled everything and provided for every people, person from the cradle to the grave, and everybody was just so very, very happy. A wonderful utopian view of history. And of course, what Ed Edward Bellamy wrote is, for I dipped into the future far as any eye could see, saw a vision of the world and all the wonder there would be, till the war drum throbbed no longer and the battle flags were furled in the parliament of man and the federation of the world. It was just five years after Bellamy wrote that uh, when Andrew Carnegie published his book, Triumphant Democracy. Now, uh, those of you who are victims of a liberal education, as I was, probably look upon Andrew Carnegie as a robber baron. But actually, he took the vast fortune that he accumulated when he sold uh, U.S. Steel to J.P. Morgan. And he invested that in foundations and endowments which were to bear his name to convert America from a free into a socialist society. And so there won't be any question when we talk about socialism, Socialism is a sincere, benevolent, idealistic concept by which the government provides for everybody uh, from each according to their ability to each according to their need and regulates the lives of people. Uh, but in truth, socialism has to have force. Somebody's got to be in charge. And what happens is you replace a free society with a feudal society because everybody is controlled by government 
The government is controlled by politicians. Politicians are sold by those of great wealth. And you move from a society that evolved from England under the Magna Carta to these ideas of individual liberty and then were uh, suddenly dramatically changed. They became America, this dream of people being free under God. Uh, we destroy that concept and we supplant it with this idea of an all-powerful government that regulates people from the cradle to the grave. And so it was that Andrew Carnegie, in his book, Triumphant Democracy, wrote, and just look at the part that's underlined, where he says, the parliament of man and the federation of the world have already been hailed by the poet, but these mean a step much further in advance of the proposed reunion of Britain and America. And so this whole idea was to begin to unite the world in pursuit of this dream of world government. 151 years after Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote the, Lox, the poem Loxley Hall, this editorial appeared on the pages of the Wall Street Journal. It's written by Arthur Schlesinger. It's entitled Bye Bye Woodrow. And it's the idea that at that time there was opposition to uh, going into NAFTA and the World Trade Organization. There were a lot of Americans who wanted to maintain our sovereignty as a nation. They didn't want to relinquish our sovereignty to this world government. And at the very end of this, why Schlesinger writes this. The world of law will not be attained by exhortation. Law requires enforcement. Let's not kid ourselves that we can have a new world order without paying for it with blood as well as with money. Maybe the cost of enforcements are too great. National interest, nearly construed, may well be a safer rule. But let us recognize that we are surrendering a noble dream. Remember those lines of Tennyson that uh, Churchill called the most wonderful of modern prophecies and that Harry Truman carried in his wallet throughout his life? For I dipped into the future, far as any eye could see, saw a vision of the world and all the wonder that would be, heard the heavens filled with shouting and the rain to ghastly dew of the nation's airy navies grappling in the central blue. Till the war drum throbbed no longer and the battle flags were furled in the Parliament of Man, the Federation of the World. Now, if you read what Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. has written, why, you'll notice he refers to Churchill. Churchill embraced this idea. Well, why did Churchill embrace this? Was Churchill the great champion of the British Empire? And why did Harry Truman uh, embrace this idea? Wasn't he dedicated to America? And then, if you go back and you remember what happened during Harry Truman's administration, uh, why Eastern Europe went communist. Now, everybody wants to say, oh, well, that was FDR, the uh, agreements he made with Stalin. But Harry Truman said it best when he said, the buck stops here. The buck stops with the president. And it happened on his watch, and he could have stopped it. But under his watch, we turned Eastern Europe over to the communists at the end of the Second World War. And then, of course, we turned China over to the communists. And what most people have forgotten is how the, China, the communists happened to take China. Well, in 1948, 47, and 49, uh, there was a policy in our State Department uh, to do everything they could to undercut General Chiang Kai-shek of the nationalist government and bring communism to power. And uh, if you go back and you read the McCarran Committee reports, which we have and which we make available to anybody who would like to have them, uh, why the, the Senate Committee found uh, that General Chiang Kai-shek had been undercut by American policy, would put an arms embargo on General Chiang Kai-shek so he couldn't buy weapons anywhere in the world. And even the weapons he had already bought and purchased, uh, which were on Okinawa and other Pacific Islands, he couldn't get his hands on. Uh, and so it wasn't that uh, he was ever defeated in battle. He didn't lose the Civil War. There wasn't any war. He just retreated about three weeks ahead of the Chinese communists who were advancing because they had nothing to fight with. Well, Congress was very upset about that. It looked like China was going to go communist, and here our boys had fought a war to allow the people of the world to determine the type of government they wanted. So Congress appropriated $125 million, which today would be probably a billion, a billion and a half dollars, for weapons for Chiang Kai-shek. But the State Department kept the ships laden with the weapons in port in San Francisco and Los Angeles for a year and a half. And when the ships finally arrived in China after uh, the communists controlled the nation, they broke open the cases uh, why the bolts didn't fit the rifles and they were therefore useless. We brought communism to China, you see. And it happened under 
Harry Truman's Watts. And the question is, why did that happen? Well, before the evening is over, I, I hope you'll understand why that happened. Because there are people who have a different vision of the world than you and I. They believe in the Parliament of Man and the Federation of the World. The second poem I encountered when I was teaching and living in South Africa, <clears throat> at that time my son was attending the University of California, uh, University of Cape Town Medical School, and I went down to visit him, and I noticed up on the hillside at the base of Table Mountain, that great flat top mountain that towers over Cape Town, uh, a monument. I'd never seen it before, and so we decided to walk up and see what it was. Uh, it looked like a small replica of the Lincoln Memorial with the vertical pillars and a flat top, but of course this was not in marble, it was in gray granite. And, uh, we trudged up the long, dusty path and came to the base of the stairs leading up uh, to the monument itself. And on either side are these great granite lions uh, guarding the entranceway. And you get inside past the pillars, and there's nothing there but a great pedestal. And on top of the pedestal, the bust of a man about twice life size with a stern look on his face and hollowed out eyes that follow you wherever you move before you've da dared to enter his sanctuary. But engraved in the granite on the pedestal beneath the bust are these words. The intense and brooding spirit still shall quicken and control. Living, he was the land and dead. His soul shall be her soul. And of course, you have to understand that that was the eulogy that was read at Cecil John Rhodes. Funeral in 1902, it was written by Rudyard Kipling, his close friend and associate. And what most people do not understand uh, is that to quicken is to come back to life after death. And Cecil Rhodes still lives on. His shadow hangs long over Africa and Europe. And the movement that he began dominates the country in which you live today. Because Cecil Rhodes had a dream a dream of the Parliament of Man, the Federation of the World, of creating a secret society uh, that would one day bring about a world government. And so he left his great fortune to two purposes. One was to the secret society, and the other was to something known as the Rhodes Scholarships. Now, it is not simply coincidence that our president, President Clinton, happens to be a Rhodes Scholar, that the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, uh, General Wesley Clark happens to be a Rhodes Scholar, uh, that the um, Deputy Secretary of State, Strobe Talbot, is a Rhodes Scholar. In fact, Rhodes Scholars are at every level of our government. They're working within our major banks, our industries. They're the presidents, not uh, teaching at our colleges. They're the presidents of our colleges uh, because the men who were taken from the United States and from Europe and from the Brit various British colonies and sent to Oxford for our Rhodes Scholarships are there indoctrinated in these ideas of world government, indoctrinated in the idea that we really need an elite uh, to rule the world because you common people are incapable of governing yourselves. And after three years there, as their faith in God is undermined and, and replaced with this belief in this new spirituality, uh, they return to America. And of course, they go into key positions. And if you want to get ahead in the world, maybe you'd like to become the president. One of the best places to go is to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. Now, the third poem was written by James Russell Lowell, describing that age-old controversy uh, that has been with us since the dawn of mankind that struggle between good and evil. And this is what James Russell Lowell wrote. Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in that strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side. Then it is the brave man chooses while the coward stands aside until the multitudes make virtue of the faith they have denied. Though the cause of evil prospers, yet his truth alone is strong though a portion be the scaffold and upon the throne be wrong. But that scaffold sways the future, for in the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch above his own. And he's describing that struggle that began in the Garden of Eden and has been continuing ever since then, a struggle between truth and falsehood, uh, between God and the forces of darkness. Now, to really understand what we're about to tell you this evening, I want to tell you a story. It's a murder mystery. It was uh, the murder on the Orient Express, and that's a picture of the Orient Express, uh, which a train which traveled 
across the continent of Europe for uh, many generations, uh, linking the mystery of the East with the rationalism of the West, went from Istanbul uh, to Paris. And the story was written by Agatha Christie of the murder on the Orient Express. It was a, a wonderful story. It was eventually made into a movie uh, with such people as Albert Finney as Inspector Perot, Lauren Bacall, Ingrid Bergman, Jacqueline Bissett, Martin Balsam, Sean Connery, Anthony Perkins, Vanessa Redgrave, and Richard Winmark as Mr. Ratchet. Truly a, a cast that most directors or producers would die for. And it starts uh, in Istanbul as the train is being boarded uh, and it's interesting that most of the people getting onto the train are either English or uh, Americans. Uh, unusual to see so many Americans boarding a train uh, in, uh, in Istanbul. Monsieur Perrault is a world famous Belgian detective. He's world famous because he's in a, a character in many of Agatha Christie's mystery stories and he always solves the mystery. Well, as the story begins, why the train is beginning to move westward, and Mr. Ratchet, played by Richard Winmark, uh, and he's truly a despicable man. To meet him, obviously, is to come to dislike him. Uh, he in, in, engages Mr. Perrault in conversation, and he says to Monsieur Perrault, I believe my life is in danger. I'd like to have you guard my life on the train. I'll give you $5,000. And Monsieur Perrault said, I am not the bodyguard. I'm a detective, world-famous detective, not interested. And, $10,000, $15,000. I'm not interested. Uh, the train goes into a tunnel, the screen goes black, and suddenly as the train emerges, why uh, Mr. Ratchet is gone. But that very evening, Mr. Ratchet is murdered. Uh, he's obviously overdosed. Uh, he is stabbed 12 times. And Monsieur Perrault is engaged by the president of the line that controls the Orient Express to solve the murder uh, so it won't in any way reflect on the train. After all, it's pretty bad for business if people are, tr are murdered on your train. And so Monsieur Perrault goes into the murder scene and he finds clues. I mean, there are all sorts of clues there. And his comment is, there are too many clues here. There are too many clues. And in some respects, that's what we really see as we look at what's going on in America today. There are too many things happening. There are too many clues. There are too many uh, causes of what's going on. There's something known as cognitive disassociation or uh, cog cognitive dissonance. And it's a concept uh, that if you feed too many ideas into people's minds, they can't think effectively. They did this with Pavlovian dogs. Uh, years ago, they would train them to uh, salivate in response to a, a buzzer. And of course, they sound the buzzer, the dog would salivate. Then they'd train him to, to salivate in response to a bell, and he would salivate. And then they'd train him to salivate in response to a, perhaps a bong or something of the sort, or uh, scratching. And, and then they'd do them all together, and he couldn't think, he, he, because our minds can only accept so many things going on at one time. And the dog would go over and curl up in the corner of the, of the cage and do nothing. And you have to understand, in many respects, this is what's happening to the American people. We face so, so many problems today. We face the problem of unrestricted abortion, increasingly militant homosexuality, where children are being taught in kindergarten that homosexuality is perfectly normal. Increasing crimes, where court system there seems to be much more concerned about the, the criminal than the, than the victim. Uh, a drug epidemic, then no matter what we do, it keeps getting worse. Uh, the failing educational system, the destruction of our family with half of our marriages ending in divorce. Uh, we find the loss of patriotism. We find new diseases, uh, HIV disease and Legionnaire's disease and Hanta uh, virus, and then we find new mycoplasm infections and all sorts of new diseases, many of them drug resistant. We don't know what to do with them. We find ever increasing government control over our lives and uh, increasing persecution of Christians, not only uh, in other countries, but even here in the United States, where uh, if you were to go to a, a teacher, were to go to a student and say, well, you might be homosexual, try it, you might like it, uh, that would be all right. But if you were to say, God loves you, why, that teacher would lose their job. And there's something wrong with the picture. The failure of our churches to speak out on moral and political issues, an ever-growing number of wars and revolutions, the absence of a missile defense for America, and the case in the face of increasing uh, Russian hostility, uh, lots of things are, are of serious concern. And I think you can't look at what's going on in the world today without being concerned. So who's really responsible for the things that are happening in America today? And there are many, many people who suggest uh, that behind everything going on, 
uh, are the bankers. Because after all, when we have wars, the bankers make money. Uh, when we have inflation, the bankers make money. When we have a recession, the bankers take your home and your farms, and the bankers make money. And there's a great deal of evidence to suggest that this is not something new, but this has been going on uh, for literally centuries. And so one of my favorite books is written by Thomas uh, Jefferson. It's called The Master Thoughts of Thomas Jefferson. The book was actually published in 1909. But it describes something that Thomas Jefferson wrote almost 200 years ago. And among his thoughts are these. Everything predicted by the enemies of banks at the beginning is now coming to pass. We are to be ruined now by a deluge of bank paper as we were formerly by the old continental paper. It is cruel that such revolutions and private fortunes should be at the mercy of avarice adventurers who instead of employing their capital, if any they have, in manufactures, commerce, and other useful pursuits, make it an instrument to burden all the interchanges of property with their swindling profits, profits which are the price of no useful industry of theirs. Prudent men must be on their guard in this game of robins alive and take care that the spark does not extinguish in their hands. I am an enemy to all bank discounting bills or notes for anything but coin, but our whole country is so fascinated by this jack-o'-lantern of wealth that they'll not stop short of its total and fatal explosion. And of course, today we see the stock market uh, progressively going up, and many, many people think it's going to keep going up forever. But I've got news for you. Uh, time and time again, uh, through the decades and through the centuries, we've seen exactly the same thing happen uh, that will happen very soon to America. Now, this is a copy of the congressional record of February of 1917. I happen to come from a town called Santa Cruz uh, in California. And uh, we have a university there. We have such people as Bettina Apthaker. She's a professor there, formerly a member of the Central Committee of the Communist uh, Party. Uh, her father, uh, uh, Herbert Apthaker was the chief theoretician of the Communist Party, and she herself had organized the free speech movement in Berkeley in 1964. We have Angela Davis there. We even gave a PhD to Huey Newton, the leader of the Black Panthers, uh, shortly before he died in a drug deal. But the advantage of having a university in your community is that you can get the books and you can get the congressional records there uh, that are readily available, or are not available to most people. So this is taken from the congressional record of February of 1917, which we got out of our university library. Congressman Calloway is writing about uh, what is going on in America in February of 1917, uh, just two months before we enter the war in Europe. Let's go to the second paragraph. In March of 1915, the J.P. Morgan interest, now those are the banking interests, J.P. Morgan is the most powerful banker in America in 1917, in 1915. So in March of 1915, the J.P. Morgan interest, the steel building, the powder interest, and their subsidiary organizations got together 12 men high up in the newspaper world and employed them to select the most influential newspapers in the United States and sufficient numbers of them to control generally the policy of the daily press of the United States. These 12 men worked the problem out by selecting 179 newspapers and then began by an elimination process to retain only those necessary for the purpose of controlling the general policy of the daily press throughout the country. They found it was only necessary to purchase the control of 25 of the greatest papers. The 25 papers were agreed upon. Emissaries were sent to purchase the policy, national and international, of these papers. An agreement was reached. The policy of the papers was bought to be paid for by the month. An editor was furnished for each paper to properly supervise and edit information regarding the question of preparedness, militarism, financial policies, and other things of national and international nature considered vital to the interests of the purchasers. The contract is in existence at the present time, and it accounts for the news columns of the daily press of the country focusing on military matters and military preparedness. Now, two months later, we went into the war. How did they get the American people uh, to go to war in 1917 in a war that had no uh, relationship to the United States? Well, they did it with atrocity stories, of course. And you control the press, and they wrote stories about how the Belgian women were being raped and ravaged by the Belgian shoulders, soldiers, how the Belgian women had their breasts cut off, and how the, Belgian, how the German soldiers were cutting off the hands of little, little boy, Belgian boys. 
And day after day after day after day after day, you read the atrocity stories. And an awful lot of Americans honestly believe this. Now, I talked many years later to uh, a gentleman who'd volunteered for service to go to the American Expeditionary Force uh, to Europe to fight those terrible Germans who were committing these horrible atrocities. And of course, by the time he reached Belgium, most of his friends were dead. And he got there, and there were no little boys with their hands cut off. There were no women who'd been raped. It was all a lie. But a lie told convincingly enough and often enough is believed. And J.P. Morgan and their control of the media convinced the entire American public that a lie was truth. Uh, many times there are atrocities, and we just never hear about them. Most of you may very well remember uh, when we were going into Desert Storm, uh, because, of course, the Iraqis had moved into Kuwait. And the stories about those wicked Iraqi soldiers who went into the hospital in Kuwait City and took the little babies out of their bas bassinets and threw them on the ground and bayoneted them. I, mean, I don't know how many of you remember those stories, but uh, this was in the press at that time. There wasn't any truth to it, but they made it up. It became the reality of the American people, and it somehow justified our getting involved in Desert Storm. One of the other interesting things that we find about uh, bankers is that a letter I found in Colonel House's papers when I went back to Yale University in 1980. And Colonel House's papers are at Yale University. Now, Colonel Edward Mandel House is one of the most important individuals of the 20th century, probably the single most important American of the 20th century. And you'll learn a lot more about him as we progress through the evening. But uh, this letter was written by Franklin Delano Roosevelt on White House stationery to Colonel House. And on the second page, written in November of 1933, why President Roosevelt wrote, I had a nice talk with Jack Morgan the other day. Now, that's the son of J.P. Morgan. He's now dead. And then goes, he goes on to say, the real truth of the matter is, as you and I know, that a financial element in the larger centers has owned the government ever since the days of Andrew Jackson, and I'm not wholly accepting the administration of W.W. That's Woodrow Wilson. So the president is writing to... Uh, Colonel House saying the bankers have controlled America uh, for going back to Andrew Jackson. That would be about 18, uh, 1832 when Andrew Jackson came into the presidency, and this was written in November of 1933. This little book, uh, Secrets Revealed, written by Dr. Dennis Cuddy, who I feel is the finest researcher we have uh, in the United States on these matters. And here he takes uh, references to articles both in the New York Times and in the Washington Times, and he comments uh, from an article on August 5th, 1995 in the New York Times, and he simply quotes them, in a small s Swiss city sits an international organization so obscure and secretive, control of the institution, the Bank for International Settlement, lies with some of the world's most famous and least visible men. The heads of 32 central banks, officials able to shift billions of dollars and alter the course of economies at the stroke of a pen. On June 28, 1998, the Washington Post published an article about the Bank for International Settlement titled, At Secret Meetings in Switzerland, 13 People Shaped the World's Economy, which described these individuals as this economic cabal, this secretive group, the financial barons who control the world's money supply. And there is a great deal of evidence to suggest that the force behind everything going on in the world today uh, is indeed the bankers. But there are other people who say, no, it's not really the bankers. The real force behind what's going on in the world today is an organization known as the Council on Foreign Relations. Because you see, most of the leading bankers of the United States just happen to belong to the Council on Foreign Relations. But here, the industrious belong as well, and the people who control uh, so much of our government, in fact. Since 1953, all but one Secretary of State have come from the Council on Foreign Relations. All but one Deputy Secretary of State have come from the CFR. All but one Director of the CIA and every Chairman uh, of the Federal Reserve System and six of our last nine Presidents. Certainly it must be the Council on Foreign Relations. That is the center of everything going on in the world today. <clears throat> in 1979, no less a person than Barry Goldwater, in his book With No Apologies, commented uh, on this fact, and he noted that when we change presidents, it is understood to mean that voters are ordering a change in national policy. Since 1945, three different Republicans have occupied the White House for a period of 16 years. Four Democrats have held this most powerful post the world has to offer for a period of 17 years. 
With the exception of the first seven years of the Eisenhower administration, there's been no appreciable change in foreign or domestic policy direction. When a new president comes on board, there's a great turnover in personnel, but no change in policy. An example, during the Nixon years, Henry Kissinger, CFR member and Nelson Rockefeller's protege, was in charge of foreign policy. When Jimmy Carter was elected, Kissinger was replaced by Zygmunt Brzezinski, CFR member and David Rockefeller's protege. Now you would think if a person of Barry Goldwater's stature uh, wrote about such things that everybody would hear about it. But amazingly enough, these things are seldom, if ever, quoted, uh, even by many of our so-called conservative leaders. Now, there are other people who will tell you, well, uh, this is all well and true. But the real force in the world is not the Council on Foreign Relations. It is the Bilderbergers. And of course, the Bilderbergers are made up not only of the leaders of the United States, uh, but the leaders uh, of Europe as well. And you will find in the Bilderbergers why the leading bankers of Europe, uh, the leading socialists of Europe, the leading capitalists of Europe, strange to find the capitalists and socialists working together in an organization. Uh, many of the leaders uh, of the um, uh, various political parties, the people who are about to become president or be out to become prime minister. In fact, it is said that Bill Clinton was actually <coughs> selected at a Bilderberger meeting back in 1991 and 1992. He was selected to replace uh, George Bush. Now, it is not coincidence that both George Bush and Bill Clinton, who ran for the presidency, one a Republican, one a Democrat in 1992, all three, of, both of them belonged to the CFR at one time, uh, the Bilderbergers and the Trilateral Commission. Well. Phyllis Schlafly uh, wrote a book in 1964, it's called A Choice Not an Echo. And in that book, she said this. Several years ago, the author of this book stumbled on a clear evidence of a very powerful, that very powerful men actually do meet to make plans which are kept secret from American citizens. While visiting at Sea Island, Georgia, this writer discovered the details of a secret meeting on nearby St. Simons Island, Georgia, held at the King and Princess Hotel, February of 1957. The most elaborate precautions were taken to prevent Americans from knowing who attended this secret meeting or what transpired there. And then she goes on to say, the participants at the St. Simons meeting were some of the biggest names in American politics, business, and the press. As described by an eyewitness observer at that meeting, those who came were not the heads of state. They were those who gave orders to the heads of state. In other words, the kingmakers. Well, there are others who say, well, you know, that's all very well and good. Uh, but it's really not the Bilderbergers. It's an organization known as the Trilateral Commission because the Trilateral Commission is actually made up not only of the leaders of Europe and the United States. It's also made up of the leaders of Asia as well. In fact, Barry Goldwater on page 280 of his book, With No Apologies, basically said this. He's talking about the implications of Governor Rockefeller's presentation have become concrete proposals advanced by David Rockefeller's newest international cabal. A cabal is sort of a secret organization of the Trilateral Commission. Whereas the Council on Foreign Relations is distinctly national in membership, the Trilateral Commission is international. Representation is allocated equally to Western Europe, Japan, and the United States. It is intended to be the vehicle for national, multinational consolidation of commercial and banking interests by seizing control of the political government of the United States. Let me read what Barry Goldwater said again. It is intended to be the vehicle for multinational consolidation of the commercial and banking interests. In other words, all throughout the world, they're going to seize banking and commercial interests, but they're going to do it by seizing control of the political government of the United States. Well, that's a pretty strong statement. You would think that people would be talking about if that. Anybody want to seize control of this political government of the United States? That suggests they really want a dictatorship, or maybe, maybe they already have a dictatorship. Well, there are others who are going to say it's really not, not uh, this organization you're talking about. It's really something called the Club of Rome. And you can actually pull this logo down off the internet site of where we got it. <clears throat> and what I'm about to show you uh, comes from the Club of Rome's internet site uh, on the web. And basically, uh, their statement is uh, that their purpose 
to, is to act as an international non-official catalyst of change. Now, this is taken from their website below. Another new development was the decision to invite prominent world figures who share the club's concern to become honorary members, although their positions may prevent them from taking a public stance, as in the case of the Queen of the Netherlands or the King and Queen of Spain. They can and do give valued moral support. Among the others are former President Gorbachev, former President Richard von Weizsäcker of Germany, the first president of newly democratic Czechoslovakia, Václav Havel, uh, the president of Hungary, the president of Argentina, etc., etc. Here, some of the most wealthy and powerful men in the world meet to plan the future. Among the leaders of the Club of Rome is a man named Maurice Strong. Now, uh, those of you who um, uh, have studied this will well recognize that Marie Strong is one of the most powerful men in the world, but he's always working within the shadows. A man who uh, never graduated from high school and yet uh, by the time he was 21 had a very important position in international finance. By the time he was 31 he headed one of the large financial corporations uh, and financial advisory companies, uh, a multi-billionaire, uh, the man who is today the senior advisor to Kofi Annan, the Secretary General of the United Nations. Now, you probably believe Kofi Annan is the Secretary General and leads the United Nations, but he is simply a figurehead for the man who really runs the UN. His name is Maurice Strong, a member of the Club of Rome. And Maurice Strong, uh, of course, it was the uh, first Secretary General of the Earth, First Earth Summit in 1972, uh, the second um, Secretary General of the Earth Summit in 1992, and the Secretary General of the Third Earth Summit in 1997. Uh, he has, of course, uh, put out the Global Biodiversity Assessment Report, which really calls for the total disruption of Western civilization. He's been quoted as saying, the only way to save the Earth is to destroy Western civilization. Uh, he has a little f farm in Colorado, it's called Baca. Uh, about 100,000 acres there, uh, where occultists from all over the world meet. Uh, they have witches, they have uh, medicine men, they have shamans, they have Satanists, they have Shirley MacLaine. Uh, according to an article in West Magazine, why uh, men like Henry Kissinger and, uh, and Robert McNamara, you remember the man who sent our boys to Vietnam to fight for 10 years but never allowed to win. Uh, they're not infrequent visitors at, uh, at Baca. Uh, Marie Strong's wife uh, happens to be a witch and she prays the sun up every morning. A strange situation that this man is a great capitalist, is working so closely with uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. In fact, the two of them are writing something known as the Earth Charter, a plan for the world and for your future. And you might, want, might wonder why uh, the former head of the Soviet KGB, uh, the so former dictator of Russia, is working with a capitalist uh, to reshape the world. And yet, of course, is the more you study this, you begin to find there may be very little difference between the leaders of the communist nations and the leaders of the capitalist nations. Well, there are other people who will tell you that you really are, are mistaken. It's really not um, a capitalist conspiracy at all. It is a communist conspiracy. And this book, The Masters of Deceit, written by J. Edgar Hoover uh, about 1960, uh, gives an excellent overview of what uh, communism is all about. And of course, at that time, communism uh, controlled about a third of, uh, of the uh, world's population, a quarter of the world's land mass. And uh, J. Edgar Hoover quotes uh, Khrushchev at that time. In June of 1957, Nikata Khrushchev, the Soviet Communist Party boss, was interviewed before a nationwide American television audience and with calm assurance he stated, I can prophesy that your grandchildren in America will live under socialism. And please don't be afraid of that. Your children will not understand how their grandparents did not understand the progressive nature of a socialist society. Now, isn't it interesting that Khrushchev would say your grandchildren would live under socialism, not under communism? But you have to understand that every communist works for socialism. Uh, there is no communism in Russia. There never was any communism in Russia because communism is when the state withers away and the state never withers away. Uh, what the state does is always gain more power like a hungry lion, always more power over the lives of the people. Now, perhaps to better understand uh, what we're speaking about, I'd like to tell you about a book called New Lies for Old. Many of you, if you listen to Barbara Walters, Tom Brokaw, or Dan Rather, may have heard that 
there is no longer any communism in the world, that we won the Cold War. Communism is dead. <clears throat> and if that indeed is true, then why do 1.2 billion people live in communist China? And there's communism in North Korea, there's communism in Vietnam, there's communism in Cuba. In fact, I used to live in Africa, as I mentioned earlier. And the communists there control Rhodesia under Mugabe. Uh, they dominate South Africa, and if Nelson Mandela is not a communist, he'll do the one comes along. I've seen him uh, with his raised clenched, flag, res, raised clenched fist in front of the um, communist flag. Uh, he surrounded himself by communists. The man slated to replace him in, indeed is a communist. Southwest Africa is controlled by a dictator named Neto. Uh, Angola is controlled by the communists. And we've recently brought uh, Kabila to power in Zaire. And Kabila is a communist. So uh, what's wrong with this idea that communism is dead? Or maybe it is all a myth. Well, let me tell you a little bit about this book. It was written by Anatoly Galitsyn, who was a major in Soviet planning. And he defected to the United States and tried to tell American intelligence that the communists had a long-range plan to convince the American people uh, that they had won the battle. And of course, as he was debriefed by the CIA, any CIA official uh, who believed him was immediately fired. And there was a group under James Angleton uh, who were just put out of the CIA or retired. Everybody who stayed in the CIA went along with the official party line uh, that communism uh, was eventually going to be defeated, and we were going to defeat it. Uh, the evil empire was going to be destroyed. This book was written in 1984. And in this, Galitsyn says very clearly that what is going to happen uh, is the fact that the Soviets are going to try to convince you that you've won the Cold War, uh, that their government's going to fall, that they're going to become more democratic. They are going to tear down the Berlin Wall, which is what they did. We didn't tear down the Berlin Wall. They tore it down. Uh, that Solidarity is going to take control uh, in Poland, and of course, uh, they're going to convince you to go ahead and unilaterally disarm, and you'll give them more and more and more money so they can build themselves up in preparation for the inevitable war that they believe is coming. Another article that comes out of the New York Times in March of 1963, IMF relents on aid to Russia, but U.S. talks tougher. Now, you have to understand, we're financing Russia today. We keep pouring uh, uh, billions and billions of dollars in. They've recently defaulted on $100 billion. And what are we doing? Why are we giving them more money? And there's something wrong with this picture. But if you go back through history, you will find, as we'll discuss later, uh, that we have financed Russia directly or indirectly since the time of the Russian Revolution back in 1917 because communism or socialism doesn't work. It's always had to have help from the West. Uh, this is a, a fax I get regularly from J. Michael Waller. Uh, the headline here, IMF promises more money as Russia threatens to arm Serbia. Where do you think that the Serbians get their MiG fighters and their anti-aircraft batteries? And uh, where do you think that they get uh, the wherewithal to withstand the intense bombing uh, that the Americans have uh, brought against them? Now, of course, they get their backing from Russia. And where does Russia get its backing? Why, they get their backing from us. Here's some from J. Michael Waller. Prophecy Club carries, uh, pardon me, from um, uh, Jeff Nyquist. Prophecy Club carries the material from Jeff Nyquist. I think it's accurate. As he points out, that Russia is stockpiling oil and food and a goal in preparation for war because they believe war is not only fightable but winnable. And I'd like to suggest to you a book that Prophecy Club offers. It's in titled Through the Eyes of the Enemy. It's written by um, Colonel uh, Stanislav Lunev, who is a colonel in the GRU. That is the Soviet military intelligence. He defected to the United States in 1992. I've talked to him personally. I've interviewed him. And I believe his book is available here. And he will tell you that the Soviets not only believe that nuclear war is fightable, they believe nuclear war is winnable. They have an antiballistic missile system. We have no antiballistic missile system. Whenever we talk about uh, building what the Russians say, why would anybody want an antiballistic missile system uh, if they weren't planning on war? We had one, incidentally. Uh, we tore it down in the, in the late 1970s under Jimmy Carter uh, because it was too expensive to keep up. Uh, the Russians not only have an anti-ballistic missile system, they have 12,000 surface-to-air missiles. Uh, they have a plan by which they can detonate a nuclear device in the stratosphere uh, if, if uh, missiles are coming in aimed at them and deflect them. They have a program by which they can release 
uh, what is referred to as brilliant pebble, pebbles. They're like little shotgun pellets uh, from fighter planes in case why missiles are aimed at them. Uh, they have a defense for themselves. They have an extensive civilian defense system with underground uh, caves in which the entire population or most of the population be uh, protected, and we have nothing comparable here in the United States. And according to Stanislav Nudev, why the Soviets are preparing for war. But of course, you're not hearing about that. Now, here's another fact that comes in. Chinese officials compare global trade to economic war. Beijing demands technology transfers from US companies. And, and there's been a great deal of talk about the Chinese stealing this or that or the other thing from us. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been helping China uh, for years. You honestly believe that Bill Clinton uh, gave all these uh, military secrets to, to the Chinese communists for a few uh, hundred thousand dollars donations? This is simply to draw your attention away from the fact that we brought communism to power uh, back in 1950. And we have helped them at every turn since then. And you really have to understand what this is about. Uh, in that little book, I referred to uh, uh, Secrets Revealed. Uh, there is a quotation from an article by David Rockefeller that occurred in the New York Times in either 1973 or 1974. And we actually have copies of it if you'd like to, to get this, in which uh, David Rockefeller talks about the Chinese Revolution. And he said the social experiment in China under Chairman Mao's leadership is the most important and successful in history. Let me repeat that. The social experiment in China under Chairman Mao's leadership is the most important and successful in history. It was just a social experiment. Oh, they'd killed 70 or 80 million people. It was an interesting social experiment. Because you see, there are people who look at the world differently than you and I and have a different attitude towards human suffering and human compassion. Well. There are many people who say that, though, that you are entirely mistaken if you believe that this is a world communist movement, because every communist is a socialist. And you remember that Khrushchev talked about your grandchildren living not under communism, but under socialism. And the real problem uh, is the socialist movement. Indeed, there is an organization known as the Socialist International. It is one of the three or four most powerful nations in the world. And most Americans have never even heard of it. Uh, but at the present time, the Prime Minister of England, Tony Blair, is a Vice President, and the Prime Minister of uh, France, and the Prime Minister of Germany, and of Italy, and of Spain. They're all Vice Presidents of the Socialist International. Uh, they hold regular meetings. They're planning on a world government. And they work towards exactly the same goal that the communists do, a one world government, a new economic system, and a new spirituality. But of course, uh, the question is not, uh, what sort of world are we moving into, but who's going to run it? And the socialists believe they're going to be in control. The Socialist International has regular meetings. And if you have access to the internet, you can look up their website and, and verify who the people are who are involved in this. Now, if you go to Ombury St. Mary, which is the uh, Beatrice Webb House, it's about 30 miles south of London. I've been there, a beautiful estate where the socialists meet on a regular basis to plan the new world. And uh, they had there, it was, it was stolen, uh, but they had there a stained glass window. We have it in the original color, but uh, this is simply a black and white reproduction. And this is where you can see their coat of arms. Their coat of arms, you'll see between the two men on the right, is a wolf dressed in sheep's clothing, because everything is deception. You see, FS for Fabian Socialism, uh, the use of deception to fool the world. On the right, you see George Bernard Shaw, and then just to the a little to the left, you see Sidney Webb. Each one of them holding a hammer. Shaw uh, is holding the world on an anvil. The caption above, remold it nearer to the heart's desire. Uh, they are remaking the world. Now, uh, then on the, below, you see pray devoutly, hammer stoutly. And so they are going to simply remold the world. That's what it's really all about. And below, you see. Um, all of these men kneeling before a list of books, among are Plato's writings, uh, and the great philosophers, because these men worship reason rather than God. And on the left, you see H.G. Wells thumbing his nose at everything going on. An excellent book, The Great Deceit, written by a man named Zygma Dobbs. And Zygma Dobbs uh, was um, the number two man uh, in the CIO. Uh, that was the uh, Coal Workers Union, uh, second only to John L. Lewis. And in about 1950-51, um, oh, 
uh, the Congress was investigating communist infiltration of our labor movement. And he was asked to testify. He testified uh, about the communists because he was concerned about the subversive influence uh, within the American labor movement. And the very evening uh, that he was, uh, after he had testified about communism and American labor unions, why John L. Lewis and Walter Ruther and his brother and the leaders of American labor, uh, which is largely controlled by people dedicated to socialism, met and they banned Zygma Dobbs from ever again being involved uh, in the American labor movement. And he couldn't understand why these men who were not themselves communists would be so concerned uh, because of his exposure of the communist or subversive influence within American labor. And so uh, he spent the rest of his life uh, studying this. He wrote several books, among which was uh, The Great Deceit. And of course, what he found out is that the communists and the socialists always work together. They all want the same objective and goal. It's simply who's going to be in charge when this whole thing comes about. And then there are others who will tell you, well, it's really not the uh, communists or the socialists, but indeed it is the humanists. Because every communist is a humanist. And every socialist is a humanist. And they constantly work together. Now, the humanists have all sorts of organizations, most of which I belong to, because I'm a researcher, really, and uh, I want to get their lit literature. Uh, this is the Humanist Manifesto. They published this, uh, uh, volume one and volume two, the first written in 1933, the second written in 1973. And here they lay out what they're about. Uh, they are pro-abortion. They see nothing wrong with homosexuality. Uh, they believe that the criminal needs somebody to back them up and to, uh, to be behind them, to protect them from the criminal justice system. And so uh, they support many times what the criminals are doing. They, don't, uh, they think that they need somebody to champion their cause to make sure they get justice. Uh, they believe there is no God. They believe there's no right or wrong. They believe our children should be taught that they are to determine uh, whatever they want to do, not having any rules that are brought forward by religious organizations. They are dedicated to socialism. They're dedicated to world government. Uh, every humanist is a socialist, dedicated to world government and to socialism. Not every communist, pardon me, not every uh, humanist is a communist, but every socialist is a humanist, and every humanist is a socialist. And so there's some people who believe that humanism is the common denominator for everything uh, going on in the world today. There are others, of course, who will tell you that the real force behind what's going on uh, is the tax-exempt foundations. The Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, the Ford Foundation, uh, the Pew Charitable Trust, the uh, uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, because these organizations, if you study them, are financing communism and socialism here in the United States. In 1953, Congress commissioned the uh, Reese Committee, uh, headed by Congressman B. Carroll Reese, to investigate the great tax-exempt foundations to find out why they had funded the propaganda arm of the Chinese Communist Movement of the United States in the late 1940s to convince the American people that uh, Chairman Mao was not a communist but was an agrarian reformer, and that if China went communist, it would be good for the Chinese people. And what they found out, of course, is that uh, the great foundations uh, were working not only to back the Chinese communists, they were actually funding the communist movement in the United States and the socialist movement in the United States that infiltrated our educational system. They had put their people into key positions uh, in many of the major universities. They had rewritten our textbooks. They had rewritten our encyclopedias. Uh, there was an interplay between our government and the foundations. And one example would be Dean Rusk. Dean Rusk just happened to be a Rhodes Scholar uh, who worked for the Rockefeller Foundation, who went into the State Department as Under Secretary of State for Far Eastern Affairs, uh, worked there to bring communism to China, uh, and then, of course, to get us into the Korean War, which was to take our attention off of the tragedy of what had happened in China. And then Dean Rusk uh, left the government and went back to the Rockefeller Foundation, now as the president. Uh, he stayed at the Rockefeller Foundation uh, for eight years. He went back then into government as secretary of state to get us involved in a no-win war uh, in Vietnam. And then, of course, he goes uh, back to as president of the Rockefeller Foundation. McGeorge Bundy, who was the director of the National Security Council, getting us involved in Vietnam, went to work as the uh, president of the Ford Foundation. So there's an interlock uh, every place between foundations and government. And it's sort of like musical chairs. And there are many people who honestly believe that the foundations 
are at the core of everything going on in the world today. There are other people, however, will tell you it's really not of the foundations at all. It's a group known as the hierarchy. And I want to tell you a little bit about the hierarchy. I belong to something known as the Lucius Trust. It used to be known as the Lucifer Trust, but that has sort of a bad name. So uh, Lucius is not as bad as Lucifer. And here's something we got from them in 1999. I want you to look at it. It talks about a festival and conference in 1999. And then it talks about mediation letting in the light. And of course, they don't tell you what the light is, but uh, they understand what the light is. And then it talks about group fusion. Now, this is the letter I got from them, and I've just copied it here. We affirm the fact of group fusion and integration within the heart center of the new group of world servers mediating between hierarchy and humanity. What are they talking about? Well, do you think that's confusing? Let's go down to Roman numeral two. Alignment, we project a line of lighted energy towards the spiritual hierarchy of the planet, the planetary heart of the great ashram of Sadat Kamara, and towards the Christ at the heart of the hierarchy. Well, you may not understand what they're saying, but you will before the evening is over. There are others who will tell you that the very, very center of everything going on today uh, is the Illuminati. And of course, if you study the Illuminati, you know that uh, it was founded on May 1st, 1776, by a man named Adam Weishaupt. And it was an organization dedicated to destroying all governments and all religions and taking over control of the world. Professor John Robinson um, actually wrote a book. He was approached to join this group. Uh, he did not. He was a Mason. And of course, the organization was working within Masonry at the time. Uh, but he wrote a book to try to explain expose exactly what was going on. Now, if you read the 1913 British Encyclopedia Britannica, they have a fair amount on the Illuminati. If you read uh, the modern British Encyclopedia Britannica, they hardly ever mention anything about it. Uh, and few people understand that the Illuminati was a very real force. My grandfather told my father uh, about the Illuminati because at one time, every person in America of any consequence knew of the dangers of the Illuminati. And of course, if you look on the back of your dollar bill, you will find this symbol. And a pyramid, an Egyptian pyramid, capped by an all-seeing eye. And beneath the, the caption, Novus Ordoro Seclorum, the new secular order or social order. And then you'll see the Roman numerals there at the base of the pyramid, 1776. And of course, the people who believe this is the symbol of the Illuminati will tell you uh, that that refers to the, year, the date that the Illuminati was founded, May 1st, 1776, not uh, to the 1776 July 4th, when America was formed as an independent state. So many, many people will tell you this is the symbol of the Illuminati. Now, let me uh, take you to the 1913 British Encyclopedia Britannica and what they were talking about. Another and obscure body of Illuminatis or Illums came to light in the south of France in 1722 and appear to have lingered until 1794, having affinities with those known contemporaneously in this country as French prophets, an offshoot of the Camisards. Of different class were the so-called Illuminati, better known as the Rosicrucians, who claimed to originate in 1422, but rose into notice in 1537, a secret society combined with the mysteries of alchemy, the possession of esoteric principles of religion. Their positions are embodied in three anonymous treaties of 1614, a short-lived movement of Republican free thought to whose adherence the name Illuminati was given was founded on May Day, 1776 by Adam Weishaupt, professor of canon law at Ingolstadt and ex-Jesuit. The chosen title of this order or society was Perfectibilitas, its members pledged to obedience to their superiors were divided into three main classes. The first included novices, Minervals, and lesser Illuminati. The second consisting of Freemasons, ordinary Scottish and Scottish Knights. The third of mystery class comprising two grades of priests and regent out of Magnus and of King. Relations with Masonic lodges were established at Munich and Friesing uh, in 1780. The order had its branches in most countries of the European continent, but its total numbers never seemed to have exceeded 2,000. 
The scheme had its attraction for literary men such as Goethe and Herder, and even for the reigning dukes of Gotha and Weimar. Internal rupture preceded its downfall, which was affected by an edict of the Bavarian government in 1785. Later, the title Illuminati was given to the French Martinis, founded in 1754 by Martinus Pasqualis, and to their imitators, the Russian Martinists, headed after 1790 by Professor Schwartz of Moscow. Now, there have been many organizations known as Illuminati. Uh, but of course, the Illuminati that was founded by Adam Weishaupt infiltrated the Masonic lodges of Europe, where in large part it just disappeared because now it could remain secret and there'd be no way people could know what was happening. The Illuminati came to the United States in about 1790, and we know that uh, by a speech that was given by Timothy Dwight, who was the grandson uh, of Jonathan Edwards, uh, who was the uh, evangelist who led the first great awakening here in the United States. And so uh, the Illuminati then entered the United States. Actually, George uh, Washington actually disowned his Masonic membership uh, because of his concern uh, over the Illuminati and the occult influences that were coming into ma American masonry at that time. Uh, there are people like Bill Snevelin and Doc Marquis uh, who have been at the higher echelons of these seepin movements because when, with masonry, uh, you do not simply have 32 or 33 degrees. As you'll learn very soon, uh, there are other degrees of masonry, for masonry is truly a fraternity within a fraternity. Now, uh, here is one of the more important books. It was written by a man who no one would accuse of being a conservative. His name is James H. Billington. He is currently the Librarian of Congress, and his book, Fire in the Minds of Men, uh, is one of the great exposés of the world occult movement. And he talks about the Illuminati. The Order of Illuminus was founded May 1st, 1776, by a professor of canon law at the University of Ingolstadt in Bavaria, Adam Weishaupt and four associates. The order was secret and hierarchical, modeled on the Jesuits, and dedicated to Weishaupt's Rousseauian vision of leading all humanity to a new moral perfection, freed from all established religious and political authority. Now, one of the more important things that Billington wrote in his book, Fire in the Minds of Men, and I wanted to bring this to you. <clears throat> he talks about the revolutionary faith was shaped not so much by the critical rationalism of the French Enlightenment, as is generally believed, as by the occultism and proto-romanticism of Germany. This faith was incubated in France during the Revolutionary Era within a small subculture of literary intellectuals who were immersed in journalism, fascinated by secret societies, and subsequently infatuated with ideologies as a secular surrogate for religious belief. The flame of faith had begun its migration a century earlier when some European aristocrats transferred their lighted candles from Christian altars to Masonic lodges. The flame of occult alchemists, which had promised to turn grass into gold, reappeared at the center of new circles seeking to recreate a golden age, Bavarian illuminists conspiring against the Jesuits, French Philadelphians against Napoleon, and Italian charcoal burners against the Habsburgs. There were secret societies all throughout Europe in the 19th century, and of course, many of them have carried over into the 20th century, and yet if you talk about secret societies today, immediately uh, you were attacked. Why? Well, because, of course, they don't want you to know about the secret societies of the last century. Now, there are others who will tell you uh, it really wasn't the Illuminati at all. The force behind what's going on in the world today is the Jews. And, of course, there are many, many people and it's amazing how many you, know, you meet across America as you go on a speaking tour uh, who honestly believe that the Jews are behind everything going on today. And, and they can point out a certain number of very interesting things. One of them is the majority of people who surrounded Lenin at the time uh, of the original revolution, the number of people on the original, in the original government of the Bolsheviks, uh, predominantly they were almost all Jews. And that's true. Uh, and every one of them but one was eventually executed. So uh, you don't want to be part of that sort of a Jewish conspiracy. Uh, the thing that I point out, of course, is that the people who surrounded Jesus Christ were all Jews too, but that doesn't make Christianity a Jewish conspiracy. M m many socialists and communists have been Jews, but many of the finest conservatives I know happen to be Jewish as well, because God's given them very, very special talents and has a very special place for them in his plan for the world. Now, those people then who cannot convince you that it is a Jewish conspiracy generally uh, will try to convince you it is a conspiracy uh, of international Jewish bankers. 
and they can come up with a great deal of evidence for that. And they will point to the financing of the Russian Revolution by Jacob Schiff, who uh, worked for Kuhn Loeb and Company. And it has been reported that he gave $20 million to, to uh, Kerensky following the revolution. And this obviously means it's a Jewish conspiracy. But you have to understand why Jacob Schiff would have given uh, money to Kerensky and to Lenin. And the reason, of course, is because of the violent anti-Semitism that existed under the Tsar. In 1905, there had been a revolution in Russia. <clears throat> And as a, um, uh, immediately after that, there suddenly appeared in Russia a document called the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. And it was circulated widely among the aristocracy. And it basically said uh, the entire world revolutionary movement, and there had already been a number of revolutionary attempts in France and in Germany and in Italy. Uh, and it said the revolution throughout the world, specifically the one here, is all a Jewish conspiracy. And this is called uh, the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. And of course, uh, because it was accepted by the Tsar and they began having an organized uh, effort to uh, destroy the Jewish population, they had something known as pogroms, and they would go in and just destroy uh, Jewish villages and kill everybody there. And this was sanctioned by the government. And it was because of that that Jews throughout the world hated the Tsar and hated what was going on there. But there's other things going on. There's a book written by Henry Ford uh, called The International Jew. Uh, many Jews today will not buy a Ford motor car because of Henry Ford's anti-Semitism, though he's long since gone. Uh, but he used the Dearborn Inter Independent uh, to push anti-Semitism. And uh, but there are a couple of interesting things about Henry Ford. One is uh, that Henry Ford uh, built up. Hitler's military potential. And there were Ford motor plants operating uh, in Germany both before and during the Second World War, providing the war materials for Adolf Hitler. Henry Ford was given the highest uh, award any civilian could be given by the Nazi government. But what most people never stop and think about is that Henry Ford also bought, uh, built the Gorky truck plant and car plant uh, in, in Russia, in, in communist Russia. He put Russia on wheels. And during the Vietnam War, I've been told that many of the flyers, uh, seeing the trucks driving down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, carrying the weapons uh, that would be used to kill American boys in South Vietnam, uh, those trucks looked very much like Ford motor trucks. And they looked like Ford motor trucks because they were Ford motor trucks. They were built by the Ford planted Gorky uh, with technology that had been transferred from, uh, from America by the Ford company. Uh, then, of course, there are the writings of Winston Churchill. Now, Winston Churchill has always had a, uh, a good press, or almost always had a good press. And yet, during the 1920s in the London Times, he wrote a great deal of anti-Semitic uh, material uh, claiming that the Bolshevik Revolution was entirely a Zionist revolution, uh, pointing to the Jews as being responsible uh, for all the troubles of Europe, uh, troubles that threatened to spread to the West. Winston Churchill. You remember we talked about in our opening remarks. Uh, he thought that those lines of Tennyson uh, were the most noble ever written. You remember the Parliament of Man, the Federation of the World. And Winston Churchill, to understand what's going on today, is to understand uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, most of you who have probably never studied the history of the First World War don't remember Gallipoli. But Gallipoli was in Asia Minor. Uh, and. Winston Churchill was the lord of the admiralty of Great Britain. And he ordered an attack on Gallipoli. Now, it, it was a, a strip of, of land adjacent to the mountains. And had the British Expeditionary Force ever gotten off the beaches, they never could have done anything because there was nothing behind them but mountains. You could never have gotten through them. Uh, and yet, he ordered this. The men were put ashore. 150,000 British soldiers died or were wounded at Gallipoli. 150,000 Turks uh, were wounded at Gallipoli. Uh, a senseless slaughter of human life and uh, many people for some years after the First World War remembered. That was Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill had insisted on it, one of the great military disasters of all time. One of the people I really enjoyed meeting in my 37 years I've in, been involved in researching what's going on was General Albert Wedemeyer. Uh, general Wedemeyer was a four-star Marine general. Perhaps some of you remember that uh, wonderful uh, docudrama, Herman Wooks, The Winds of War. Uh, and there, how many of you remember that? 
basically, it was a story about an American general um, played by Robert Mitchum who was going to the White House to have dinner with Churchill and FDR. That, in real life, was General Albert Wedemeyer. He was the chief planner for the American military, for the American army, in the years leading up to and at the beginning of the Second World War. And I spent several weekends with him, a great deal of time. And one of the things he pointed out was that Winston Churchill had insisted uh, in 1943, and early 1943, we were in, ready to end the war. Uh, we had the men, we had the material, and General Wedemeyer wanted to attack the enemy. That was Germany. Winston Churchill didn't want to attack the enemy. He wanted to attack North Africa. And of course, they had a, a, a marked disagreement over this. And uh, Winston Churchill prevailed upon uh, Roosevelt uh, to send General Wedemeyer off to India to be banished because he wouldn't go along with the idea of invading North Africa, which accomplished absolutely nothing other than to kill a lot of people, bypass North Africa, go after the enemy. And then after we attacked North Africa, we attacked Sicily. And then after we attacked Sicily, we attacked Anzio. And then we fought up the little narrow uh, boot of Italy where we could never possibly make a, a breakout losing you know, uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of men. Uh, the interesting thing, we lost more men at the invasion of Anzio than, uh, than uh, General MacArthur lost in all of the invasions of all of the islands in the South Pacific. Why didn't Churchill want to end the war? Why did he insist on the bloodletting at Gallipoli and in North Africa. Why didn't he end the war? Well, uh, before the evening is over, of course, we'll give you the answers to that. <clears throat> the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. I don't know how many of you have ever had an opportunity to read this, but if you ever have the opportunity, let me suggest that you don't bother to read it. <laughs> and the reason that you shouldn't read it is because it's so convincing. It really is. It, it is a totally evil document. Uh, it will tell you that uh, according to this, that the Jews are going to gain control of the gold of the world. The Jews are going to con gain control of the educational system and, and dumb down the people who are not Jewish. They refer to them in this uh, document as the goyim. And that they are going to take over the entertainment. They're going to uh, destroy the morality of the people. And they are going to begin working towards this world socialist government. They're going to work within the Masons. It's, it's a very, very convincing document because uh, you'll see a lot of truth in it. The trouble is that it wasn't written by the learned elders of Zion. Uh, there are a number of books that go into this, and I recommend them to you if you're interested in documenting what I'm about to say. <clears throat> a book by Norman Cohn, Warrant for Genocide, and a series of books by James Webb, The Occult Conspiracy, The Occult Hierarchy, uh, The Occult Underground, point out uh, that the protocols were written uh, by somebody associated with an organization known as Theosophy and smuggled into Russia where they were translated into Russian. They were originally written in French, translated into Russian, uh, and then, of course, circulated in Russia leading up to the pogroms. After the Russian Revolution, they were, went into Germany, and they became the basis of convincing many Germans uh, that it was the Jews that were uh, behind everything wrong in the world, which, of course, gave Adolf Hitler's anti-Semitic policies and the Holocaust a great deal of justification. Uh, but one of the more interesting parts uh, of the protocols uh, the story of the protocol centers around a man named Colonel Edward Mandel House. And I talked to you about him a little earlier, and I showed you the letter that uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had written to him in November of 1933. Uh, Actually, when I went through Colonel House's papers at Yale back in 1980 uh, on several occasions, I came across this. Uh, this is the protocols of the meetings of the Zionist men of wisdom. Uh, it is, for all intents and purposes, a copy of the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, but it's different than any other translation because the wording is different, although the ideas are the same, the paragraphs are the same, the wording is different. It is a different translation than any that I know that's available in the West. And so where did it come from? I mean, the original one was in French, and of course then it went into Russian, translated into Russian, translated into English by a man named Victor Marsden, and circulated in America, and that is not this translation. Uh, this is a different translation. Now, Colonel House was very active in 1905 when this first uh, went into Russia. Why did Colonel House leave this in his papers, knowing that someone in the future would find it and would comment on it? I've read a great deal about Colonel House. I've never once seen any mention of the fact that he left a copy of the protocols. He wrote a book in 1911. It was called Philip Drew Administrator. Uh, 
In that book, he laid out the plan to, for the establishment of a dictatorship in America using many of the ideas from the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. Uh, he wrote the book anonymously, and one of the things that uh, he, uh, he did was to leave a clue so that people would be able to figure out who wrote the book, uh, but he would never admit that he was the author, at least until about 1920 or 21. Uh, he said, let's have a meeting at... Uh, Mandel House. Well, his name was Edward Mandel House, so it was pretty uh, clear uh, who was actually uh, had written the book. But he liked to do things like this. Colonel House had some very, very strange powers. Uh, he controlled the President of the United States. And uh, people at that time were always curious, how was he able to control the President of the United States? A fascinating book, My First 83 Years in America, was uh, written by Ambassador Gerard, who was the American ambassador to Germany uh, during, the first, but during the Second World War. No, uh, and, pardon me, during the First World War. And uh, Ambassador Gerard um, uh, tells us that in, by 1915, the Germans wanted to end the war. You remember, it started in 14 and went to 1918. But by 1915, the Germans, February 1915, they wanted to get this war over with. It. Uh, and, of course, it was accomplishing nothing. And so he was approached. Uh, he wrote to President Wilson and said, now is the time to enter negotiations. Uh, we can be the intermediary. We can bring peace, stop the war. And he doesn't get a letter back from the president, he gets a letter back from Colonel House that says, uh, it's not time to stop the war, the British don't want to stop the war. And furthermore, all future correspondence between you and the president will come through me. And uh, Ambassador Gerard writes in his, his book, I mean, where did this guy come off? Where did he come from? He was never elected, he was never appointed by the Senate, he has no standing at all, and yet he directs me that I can't contact the president who appointed me, I have to go through him. Uh, Colonel House and some of the books written at that time uh, would go into a room and talk to people and he'd maybe fix somebody and he'd begin talking to them and uh, after he had left an idea would come into their mind and that idea they'd think would be their own and they'd begin acting on it never realizing that it was Colonel House's idea and the man who commented that uh, never understood how this had come about. Uh, one of the more interesting things about Colonel House uh, is his diary and the reason I went to Yale is because I wanted to read his diary and I'd, I had I've uh, read all of the summaries of the diary, four volumes I have, the intimate papers of Colonel House written by Charles Seymour, uh, but I was reading things that other people had written that had come from the diary that weren't included uh, in, the, in the, what was available uh, at that time for the diary in 1980. And so I went to Yale University and found out that the diary had been given to Yale in 1923. It had been covered a period from about, oh, perhaps 1911 to 1923. On almost a daily basis, Colonel House kept this diary. And then he had a proviso that it would not be uh, available for public scrutiny until 50 years had passed. So that was 1973, 1923, 1973 would be available. Immediately it was bought up by Times Mirror Company and copyrighted so it could be published and then never published. And to this very day, it's never been published. Uh, when I was there in 1923, they allowed me to uh, copy it because they were sure that it was going to be uh, available you know, uh, and printed at any time, although they were going to put it on microfiche. And I don't know how many books you've ever read on, on microfiche, which is little transparencies you flash up on a screen. Uh, but one of the fascinating stories that they told, uh, and Colonel House writes this, he said, uh, I had lunch with Clemenceau. Now, Clemenceau uh, was the Prime Minister of France. And this is about 1919, uh, when they're working on the Treaty of Versailles. And Clemenceau was very worried about the Communist Revolution because the Communists were saying, we are going uh, to destroy the West, we're going to get revolutions in Europe, and we're going to overthrow capitalism. The Communist leaders were saying this, Lenin was saying that. And, and so Clemenceau was saying, we better put these Communists down before something happens. And uh, but Colonel House said and wrote, uh, but I was able to convince uh, Clemenceau that nothing could be done to put down the communists militarily. And then I had lunch with Orlando. He was the prime minister of Italy. And, and he had uh, ex the same views. He wanted to do something about communism. I was able to convince him uh, that we could do nothing about communism. But, and then he writes, I knew what I told them wasn't true. I knew with a small mercenary unit and a, a few battalions of artillery, we could put down the communists, but I didn't want Clemenceau in Orlando to know that. Now, why would this man, who was not a communist, want communism to survive? It, it really, in many ways, doesn't make sense. Uh, and how was he able, actually, to convince these leaders of the world of something that wasn't true and that he knew wasn't true? 
How was he able to control both Woodrow Wilson, who said I would never make a decision without my, uh, the advice of my good friend, Colonel House, and President Roosevelt? How was he able to do it? Well, let's go uh, to a fascinating book written by my friend Ed Griffin. And the reason I put this up here is because it has uh, some sections in it from a book entitled uh, British Agent, written by uh, Bruce Lockhart. Bruce Lockhart had been sent to Russia after the Russian Revolution by a man named Lord Alfred Milner. Now, you remember I told you earlier that Cecil Rhodes had left his vast fortune he'd accumulated uh, by taking control of the diamonds and the gold mines of South Africa, and leaving it for a purpose, two purposes, one a secret society, and the other for the Rhodes Scholarships, the Rhodes Trust. Upon Cecil Rhodes' death in 1902, uh, control of the Rhodes Trust was taken over by a man named Lord Alfred Milner, uh, who by 19... Uh, 17, 1918, was the most powerful man in England, but always working behind the scenes, never elected to office, uh, but the man who really controlled uh, what was going on. And he sent Bruce Lockhart, Colonel uh, Lord Alfred Milner, sent Bruce Lockhart to uh, Russia to work with the communists who had just taken control. And, of course, Lockhart writes that one of the strange things, he could never understand why it was that Lenin, the dictator of Russia, seemed to be so subservient and uh, almost con con condescending, uh, going along with anything that was suggested to him by American capitalists who were there. And in fact, many of these uh, seemed to be related to the American Federal Reserve System. And, and he was just, he never understood why uh, such things were going on. It didn't seem right that uh, Lenin, the communist, would be so concerned uh, of working with the capitalists. And, of course, there are a number of other books that were written uh, at that time. One of them is the autobiography of Sir George Buchanan. Sir George Buchanan was the uh, English ambassador uh, to St. Petersburg, to Russia, at the time of the Communist Revolution. And in his biography, he has about 10 pages talking about these foolish people who were saying that the English had financed the Russian Revolution. And, of course, um, he poo-poos the idea. But as you read what he has to say, uh, you begin to say, well, gee, the French thought it happened, and this one, and that one, and, and there's a great deal of evidence out there that uh, the British were involved in financing the Russian Revolution to overthrow their ally in the First World War, which really didn't make sense, because, of course, if Russia got out of the First World War, it would least release uh, the uh, German troops from fighting uh, on the Eastern Front so they could come to the West and kill more Britishers. But a lot of things in this whole story really don't make sense. Uh, the second book we list is Tsarism and Revolution, written by a Russian general who claims that Lord Milner was responsible for the Russian Revolution, the first revolution to, uh, when Kerensky came to power. Uh, then, of course, one of the most fascinating books is the bottom one, uh, General Wrangel's Memoirs. And, of course, General Wrangel was the commander uh, of the Army of the South, a white Russian army that was opposing the communists. And, of course, the Russian people did not want communism. They didn't want uh, this kind of ruthless government that they saw uh, even being enforced in, uh, in St. Petersburg and other areas that the communists controlled. And so the, the Russian people were solidly behind General Wrangel, and he was winning battle after battle after battle. And he made one great tactical error, the same error that uh, General Jiang, Chiang Kai-shek was to make um, uh, some years later. He, uh, General Chiang Kai-shek became dependent upon America. Uh, General Wrangel became dependent upon the British for his supplies. And of course, uh, he writes in his memoirs that, uh, first of all, he buys airplanes. He's able to collect taxes from the people in the area he occupies, uh, and he buys airplanes. And what do the, Rus the English do? But they sabotage his airplanes. And then they come to him and they say, you will withdraw or we'll cut off all of your uh, ammunition and supplies, and all of your men will be killed because they'll have nothing to fight with. And so eventually he's forced to simply retreat because they cut off his medical, his uh, uh, munitions and, and, and war supplies. And he never understands why the British were so intent upon the defeat of the opposition to the communists. But then, uh, of course, uh, General Wrangel never understood uh, that the most influential man in England at that time uh, was Lord Alfred Milner, who had taken over the leadership of the Rhodes Movement upon Rhodes' death in 19. Oh, two. Well, then who does really control the Jewish banks of the world? Well, we could take uh, Lazard Brothers in Great Britain. 
uh, certainly a very Jewish sounding name, and yet for many, many years the CEO of Lazard Brothers was a Lord Brand. Name doesn't mean much to you, uh, but you remember I told you about Lord Alfred Milner who had taken control uh, of the round table group, the front for Cecil Rhodes Secret Society. Well, upon Milner's death, the uh, leadership of the round table group uh, which was the front for that secret society was taken over by Lord Brand uh, who actually led the round table uh, up until the uh, 1960s. Uh, we have here in the United States Lazard Brothers, certainly a very Jewish sounding bank and yet pardon me, Lehman Brothers here in the United States and yet for many years uh, Lehman Brothers was headed by uh, a Greek named Pete Peterson uh, who just happened to be the director of the Council on Foreign Relations uh, and of course the uh, Goldman Sachs here in the United States. Goldman Sachs uh, right at the present time has five Rhodes Scholars in key positions in banking. So you know, much of what you have heard about the Jewish influence in banking uh, really is not so. Now there are many, many people of course who will try to convince you that the real culprit uh, is the Catholic Church, specifically the Jesuits. And they will suggest that the Jesuits operate as a secret society and it is the Jesuits' influence in South America that has led to the liberation theology and many of the revolutions there. And they're firmly convinced the Catholics are behind everything going on. Or if not the Catholics uh, as a whole, then the Knights of Malta, which is a uh, rather secretive uh, group made up of Catholic males. On the other hand, uh, many of the Catholics will tell you uh, that the real force behind what's going on in the world today are the Protestants, specifically a secret Protestant organization known as the Masons. And of course there's a great deal of evidence to suggest that this is actually correct because uh, you will find, for instance, that uh, most of America's founding fathers were Masons. The majority of the men who signed the Constitution were members of the craft. Washington, D.C. was laid out uh, in a Masonic pattern, and those of you who've seen Bill Schneblin's uh, videos will actually see pictures of Washington, D.C., and find out the street pattern is laid out uh, in Masonic symbology. Every major building in Washington, D.C. has a Masonic plaque on it. But the most significant thing uh, is that Freemasons controlled the United States Supreme Court from 1941 to 1971. And during that period of time, they took God out of our schools. Because you see, the Masons worship the great architect of the universe, the God of the Buddhist, the Brahmin, uh, the Hindu, the Mohammedan, the Shintoite, uh, the God of the whole world, but not the God of the Bible. Because the God of the Bible is not the God of the Mohammedan and, and of the Hindu and of the, uh, the Buddhist. And so uh, what most people do not understand uh, is that between 1941 and 1971, the Masons controlled the United States Supreme Court, began to centralize all power of Washington, D.C., undermining the very fabric uh, of our constitutional concept of limiting the power of the federal government. Four of the six Supreme Court justices who voted to take God out of our schools were Masons. That was Tom Clark, uh, William O. Douglas, uh, Earl Warren, and black. In other words, the, the Masons uh, were responsible for taking God out of our schools, and they did it intentionally because they've always wanted to create a wall of separation between church and state. And I suggest that probably most of you have never heard that. It's never mentioned by conservative organizations across America, and you might ask yourself why that would be. Now, uh, if you talk to Masons, they will point to the symbol on the back of the dollar bill, and they will tell you that is a Masonic symbol. And, of course, they will use this in many of their publications. Uh, and they claim that this pyramid capped by the all-seeing eye is indeed a Masonic symbol. Now, I've never met a Mason I didn't like, so how do you explain uh, what they are doing? Well, let me tell you what Manly P. Hall has said. Now, Manly P. Hall, you remember we started our program this evening talking about Manly P. Hall, uh, the most distinguished and important Masonic philosopher of modern times. And in his book, The Ancient, or The Lectures on Ancient Philosophy, written in 1929, he said this, Freemasonry is a fraternity within a fraternity, an outer organization concealing an inner brotherhood of the elect. It's necessary to establish the existence of these two separate yet independent orders, the one visible, the other invisible. The visible society is a splendid camaraderie of free and accepted men enjoined to devote themselves to ethical, educational, fraternal, patriotic, and humanitarian concerns. But the invisible society is a secret and most august fraternity 
whose members are dedicated to the service of the mysterious arcanum, arcandrum, a secret or mystery. In each generation, only a very few are accepted into the inner sanctuary of the work. Uh, one of the better books on this is Behind the Lodge Door by Paul Fisher, and he tells you, uh, without any question, that between 1941 and 1971, uh, the Supreme Court was dominated by Masons in ratios of five to four to eight to one. During that 30-year period, the court erected a wall separating things religious from things secular. It was an epoch when prayer and Bible reading were deracinated from public education and when decisions after decisions succeeded in prohibiting any state financial assistance to religious schools. And nobody ever talks about it, and I wonder why. Well, of course, the magazine that was put out by the Masons for many years was known as the New Age magazine. Some years ago, they stopped calling it New Age. They call it now the, uh, the Shrine Journal uh, because there was another New Age magazine to denote a new movement within America called the New Age or sometimes the Aquarian Conspiracy. This is a book about the Aquarian Conspiracy, about the New Age movement. You'll notice this logo on the front. Uh, if you look very carefully, you'll notice the three sixes intertwined. And in that book, Marilyn Ferguson, who is dedicated to this a purpose, tells us what it's all about. And she tells us uh, that a leaderless but powerful network is working to bring about radical change in the United States. Its members have broken with certain key elements of Western thought. They may even have broken continuity with history. This network is the Aquarian conspiracy. It's a conspiracy without a political doctrine, without a manifesto, with conspirators who seek power only to disperse it and whose strategies are pragmatic, even scientific, but whose perspectives sound so mystical that they hesitate to discuss it. Activists acting, asking different kinds of questions, challenging the establishment from within. Uh, she names among uh, the people associated with this movement, Zygnu Brzezinski, who was actually recruited by David Rockefeller to organize the Trilateral Commission. There are others who would tell you the force behind what's going on today is truly the oligarchy, the, the crown heads of Europe. Uh, the Habsburg, the English monarchy, the uh, Queen of the Netherlands, the King and Queen of Spain. And you remember uh, that the latter two were part of the Club of Rome. So there seems to be almost a, a certain amount of incest in these various organizations. There are others who talk about the Priori of Sion, uh, which is supposedly a secret society uh, that, tra that traces its origins back to the Merovingian uh, dynasties of the 5th and 6th century in southern France, outlined in a book called Holy Blood, Holy Grail, uh, that basically says that there is a bloodline uh, that flows through the uh, monarchies of Europe, a royal bloodline that goes back very, to the House of David. Now, there are other people who say, well, the real force behind what's going on is something known as the Order of the Quest. And you may not have heard of this, but it's described in a book by Manley P. Hall entitled The Secret Destiny of America. Now, most of you may have wondered where the emblem on the back of the dollar bill came from, the pyramid capped by the all-seeing eye. Basically, it came from the back of the Great Seal of the United States. It was placed on the back of the Great Seal of the United States in 1782 and then kept there secretly, subsequently, until it was put on the back of the dollar bill in 1935 by a Masonic president at the behest uh, of a Mason who was Henry Wallace, the Secretary of Agriculture at that time. But the understanding of the Great Seal is an understanding of the occult movement and its influence on America. Let me tell you what Manly P. Hall tells us about the Great Seal on the back, uh, or the emblem on the back of the Great Seal of the United States. On the reverse of our nation's great seal is an unfinished pyramid to represent human society itself, imperfect and incomplete. Above floats the symbol of the esoteric orders, in other words, the secret orders. The radiant triangle with the all-seeing eye. There's only one possible origin for these symbols, and that is the secret societies which came to this country 150 years before the Revolutionary War. But there can be no question that the Great Seal was directly inspired by these orders of the human quest and that it set forth the purpose of this nation. Now, let me explain to you what he is, in essence, saying, uh, is that the uh, occult organizations, the secret societies, came to America uh, shortly after the pilgrims arrived in about 1620. And the purpose of America uh, was to bring about the New World Order. 
They were to use America to create Novo Ordo Seclorum. And that's exactly what's happening today. The power of America is being used to force all nations into the world government. And that's what you're seeing in Kosovo, uh, why we are simply bombing the cities, destroying everything. Uh, and if you don't give in, why, of course, that'll be a good lesson to other people. And here's Manly P. Hall, the leading occult philosopher uh, of modern times, essentially telling you that. And the symbol on the back of the great seal of the United States. This is uh, written in 19, about 1930 or so, long before it was even put on the back of the dollar bill. Uh, the seal on the back, of, the mark on the back of the great seal symbolizes that. There are others who will tell you that the force behind what's going on in the world today is the Rosicrucians. Uh, the Rosicrucians go back. Uh, to the Knights of the Rosy Cross. They have to do uh, with the Crusades. They came to the forefront in about 14, uh, 1400s. Uh, they tie into Gnosticism. I've interviewed them on my radio programs. Uh, they will tell you that the Bible is all right, but what you need is the secret behind the Bible, because that will give you the power. There are others who, of course, believe that the real force behind what's going on today is the Skull and Bone Society and a cult fraternity at Yale University. Uh, the people we usually associated with would be Prescott Bush, George Bush, and of course his son, uh, George Bush Jr., who may well be the next president of the United States, is a Yale graduate, and I suspect he comes from the Skull and Bone Society. Uh, this is known as America's secret establishment in Professor Sutton's book. Uh, he goes into the background of how all of these great families tie into what is referred to as the order, the Whitney family, Phelps family, Bundy family, Lord family, Rockefellers, Harriman, Warehouser family, Sloan, Pillsbury, Davison, Payne, Gilman, Wadsworth, Taft, Perkins, Stimson. Stimson, Henry Stimson was the Secretary of War uh, during the Second World War, member of the Council on Foreign Relations, wrote a book with a man named McGeorge Bundy. McGeorge Bundy uh, was the... Uh, head of the National Security Council when we got us into the Vietnam War. The two of them got together and wrote a book entitled On Watch. And of course, both of them come from the Council on Foreign Relations. There are other people who believe what's going on today is really related to theosophy. And theosophy is a secret society that was created by uh, uh, Madame Blavatsky, Helena Petrovic Blavatsky, uh, who was a Russian mystic. Uh, who organized a secret society in 1875. It has branches today in Wheaton, Illinois, headquarters and uh, uh, in Ojai in California. Uh, and of course, this woman, who really did not have much of an education, wrote two of the most brilliant books. In fact, she didn't write them. They were channeled to her uh, by a demonic spirit. One was The Secret Doctrine. Uh, the other was Isis Unveiled. And she recruited then into her organization people like Arthur Colin Doyle, uh, who created Sherlock Holmes, uh, William Stead, who you will hear more of uh, shortly. Uh, certainly her most famous disciple of the 19th century was a man named Thomas Edison, who would uh, uh, begin to meditate. And this is what you're taught to do when, of course, you're dealing with the occult and come up with great ideas like the electric light, uh, the ticker tape, uh, the phonograph, uh, the um, motion pictures. All of these were things that Thomas Edison created, and we look upon him as this great genius, and he was a great genius, but he had uh, mystical forces. He was a dedicated disciple of Madame Blavatsky. In the 20th century, of course, her best-known disciples were a man named Schnickelgruber, who's also known as Adolf Hitler. Uh, and of course, he regularly read the secret doctrine. This is where he got his mystical force, uh, the, his ability to control men, to hold crowds transfixed for hours, standing there uh, in, in front of the chancellery as he would address them, and his ability to dominate and control so many people. Another very, very famous disciple of Madame Blavatsky was uh, Margaret Sanger, who created Planned Parenthood, uh, which is still working to get, getting uh, hundreds of millions of dollars every year to push their population control, eugenic programs throughout the world. Uh, both Adolf Hitler and Margaret Sanger were dedicated to racial purity, uh, believing that the black races and brown races and red races and yellow races were all inferior. Uh, they believed only the Anglo-Saxons were fit to rule, and they set out to exterminate them. And of course, uh, both of them were violently anti-Semitic. And the fact that none of this is ever mentioned reflects the degree of control that today exists over what the American people think. Now, there are other people who really don't believe uh, anything other than the unidentified flying objects. And these little critters are out there, of course, beaming their ideas down uh, into our minds. They believe that that is what's behind what's going on in the world today. 
So let me take you briefly back uh, to Monsieur Perrault and the murder on the Orient Express. Monsieur Perrault uh, realizes uh, that the murder of Mr. Ratchet is tied in uh, to a kidnapping in the United States. A little girl named Daisy Anderson has been kidnapped, uh, or was kidnapped. Uh, a ransom was paid for her return, uh, but instead of returning her, uh, the little girl was murdered. One of the kidnappers was uh, apprehended, and before he was executed, he identified the other kidnapper who had kept all of the money, and it was none other than Mr. Ratchet. And then as Monsieur Perrault begins to survey uh, the evidence and the people on the train, all of them are either English or American, and every single one of them, in one way or another, was tied in uh, to the Anderson family. Now, of course, Mrs. Anderson, after the death of Daisy Anderson, had had a stillborn birth, and then she had committed suicide, and then her husband uh, had committed suicide, and a maid uh, at the compound where the kidnapping had taken place, had committed suicide. So there were five deaths uh, associated with the kidnapping, and of course, all of them tied back into Mr. Ratchet. And Monsieur Perrault, as he surveys what's going on, makes the observation uh, there are just too many clues. There are too many clues. Well, I wanted to take you into how I became involved uh, in trying to understand what's going on in the world today. One of the first books I ever read was written by Dan Smoot entitled The Invisible Government. Dan Smoot had worked for the FBI was busy trying to expose communism in America, and then he came across the Council on Foreign Relations. Now, this book was taken to mess with the major publishers, but when it was pointed out that Herbert Hoover, who was a great hero of the conservatives and the Republicans in America, was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, nobody would publish it, so he self-published it. Then he took it to the distributors, and no distributor would distribute it. He put out a million copies of this book through his radio programs. Uh, but an interesting study in thought control is to try to go to your libraries today and get a copy of Dan Smoot's book, The Invisible Government, and you'll get a book about the CIA because they published another book called The Invisible Government by the same title. So when you ask for The Invisible Government, you got it. But of course, you didn't find out about the real invisible government, the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, uh, let me just point out, uh, the CIA is not America's invisible government. Uh, the people who carry out most of the, uh, the illegal actions in America today is something that is mentioned in hushed terms in Washington, D.C. as no such agency, the NSA, the National Security Agency. They're the ones who tap all of your telephones, all of your faxes, and they do it by computer. Uh, but I want you to know that our government would never violate our own laws. They get the British to do this. This is known as Project Echelon, and your t telephones and your fax communications are tapped. The British do this, and in return, we tap their telephones in Great Britain and Europe. And the Europeans are very upset about this. And if you want to verify it, you can get the information from the Free Congress Foundation. Uh, amazing, amazing the fact that most people have no idea about so much of what's going on in the world today. But of course, the most important book was written in 1966, and it was called Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time. And it was written by Professor Carol Quigley, who was Bill Clinton's mentor when Bill Clinton attended Georgetown University uh, in 1966, at the same time that this book was actually published. Bill Clinton, speaking uh, when he accepted the Democrat nomination for the presidency of the United States on July 16, 1992, said this. As a teenager, I heard John Kennedy's summons to citizenship, and then as a student at Georgetown, I heard that call clarified by a professor named Carol Quigley. Well, now, why is Carol Quigley's writing so important? Well, uh, because he found out about the secret society. Now, this comes from page 950 of A Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time. And most Americans, uh, immediately after the Second World War, believed that there was a communist conspiracy that was responsible for Eastern Europe and China going communist. And the question was asked, you know, are the communists working at the upper echelons of our government? And Professor Quigley answers that question. Now, this is 1966. This myth, like all fables, does, in fact, have a modicum of truth. There does exist and has existed for a generation an international Anglophile network which operates to some extent in the way the radical right believes the Communists act. In fact, this network, which we be identify as the round table groups, has no aversion to cooperating with the Communists or any other group and frequently does so. 
I know of the operation of this network because I've studied it for 20 years and was permitted for two years in the early 1960s to examine its papers and secret records. I have no aversion to it or most of its aims and have for much of my life been close to it and many of its instruments. I've objected both in the past and recently to a few of its policies, but in general, my chief difference of opinion is it wishes to remain unknown. And I believe its role in history is significant enough to be known. And then, of course, he goes on uh, to explain the joke. And we'll just get down here to the lower part of here. Uh, there is, however, a considerable degree of truth behind the joke, a truth which reflects a very real power structure. It's this power structure which the radical right in the United States has been attacking for years in the belief they're attacking the communists. This is particularly true when these attacks are directed, as they so frequently are, at Harvard Socialism or at left-wing newspapers like the New York Times and the Washington Post or at foundations and their dependent establishments. And what he's saying is, uh, they've been putting you on all this time, fellas. This isn't the communists. Uh, this is the power elite uh, who are doing these things. Then, of course, he went on to discuss uh, what was happening as far as our electoral process. And, of course, he went on uh, basically to say this. The chief problem of American political life for a long time has been how to make two congressional parties more national and international. The argument that the two parties should represent opposed ideas and policies, one perhaps of the right and the other of the left, uh, is a foolish idea acceptable only to doctrinaire and academic thinkers. Instead, the two parties should be almost identical so the American people can throw the rascals out at any election without leading to any profound or extensive shifts in policy. So you go to the polls every uh, four years and you vote for the candidate uh, of their choice. Now, in 1966, when this book was published, uh, Bill Clinton uh, was at Georgetown University, uh, or shortly thereafter. Anyway, this is what Professor Quigley was talking about wars. The rather naive American idea, and this comes from page, uh, of, 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 let's see, 1201. The rather naive American idea that war aims involve the destruction of the enemy's regime and the imposition on the defeated people of a democratic system with a prosperous economy, such as they had never previously known, will undoubtedly be replaced by the idea that the enemy regime must be maintained, perhaps in a modified form, so that we have some government with whom we can negotiate in order to obtain our more uh, limited aims. <clears throat> and what Professor Quigley was saying is you're not going into war to win them anymore. And Bill Clinton was smart enough to realize uh, that, of course, uh, it would be very, very foolish for him to go to Vietnam and risk his life in a war that we had no intention of winning. Well, then Professor Quigley went on to give us the background of the secret society that was to come to control the world. And he starts out uh, talking about Professor Ruskin. Uh, and here we are. Until 1870, there was no professorship of fine arts at Oxford. But in that year, thanks to the Slade bequest, John Ruskin was named to such a chair. He hit Oxford like an earthquake. Not so much because he talked about fine arts, but because he talked also about the empire and England's downtrodden masses, and above all, because he talked about all three of these things as moral issues. And then let's get down to this uh, level here. Ruskin's message had a sensational impact. His inaugural lecture was copied out in longhand by one undergraduate, Cecil Rhodes, who kept it with him for 30 years. Rhodes feverishly exploited the diamond and gold fields of South Africa, rose to be prime minister of the Cape Colony, contributed money to political parties, controlled parliamentary seats, both in England and South Africa, and sought to win a strip of British territory uh, across Africa from the Cape of Good Hope to Egypt, and to join these two extremes together with a telegraph line and ultimately with a Cape to Cairo Railway. And of course, one of the things they did is they created the Boer War. They created it to begin to consolidate South Africa so that they could run their rail lines and their telegraph line from the Cape to Cairo. Uh, well, of course, Rhodes died uh, before the war was ever completed, and Lord Milner then uh, went ahead with this. Uh, he goes, Professor Quigley goes on to tell us how the Council on Foreign Relations, America's Invisible Government, came about. Uh, this is on page 952. And he's talking about how, first of all, the round table uh, is the front group for the secret society. And then the front group for the round table, because you have, like an onion peel, you have layers within layers within layers. Uh, the front group for the round table was the Royal Institute of International Affairs. 
uh, had its nucleus in each existing submerged roundtable group. Now, there's a roundtable group in every Commonwealth country, Australia, uh, New Zealand, uh, South Africa, Canada, or Great Britain itself. Uh, in New York, it was known as the Council on Foreign Relations. That was a front for J.P. Morgan and Company and the, a, the small American roundtable group. There was a roundtable group here. Uh, you had uh, people like Thomas Lamont in it, uh, Nancy uh, uh, Astor. Uh, you had people <clears throat> here like uh, Walter Lippmann, uh, the great commentator. He was a great commentator because he was part of the secret society, and they pushed him as the great uh, pundit who everybody would have to listen to. So the Council on Foreign Relations began, became uh, America's invisible government, and the fact that most people don't realize that uh, simply shows how powerful they are. Uh, they today control uh, both the liberal and conservative media. They control all of our television networks. They control most of our major magazines. They control publications. They control uh, distribution of books. They control what the American people think. Now, uh, this is really rather interesting because here they're really talking about uh, the uh, financing of communism in the United States. And let's just go down here to the last paragraph. Uh, who finances the communists in the United States? The last paragraph at the bottom, the chief evidence, however, can be found in the files of HUAC, the House on American Activities Committee, which shows that Thomas Lamont, and he is a senior partner in J.P. Morgan and Company, his wife Flora and his son Corliss as sponsors and financial agents, angels of almost a score of extreme left organizations, including the Communist Party itself. Who, do you really think the communists in Russia have enough money to fund the Communist Party? Oh, they may have been sending some money over, but most of the money, of course, uh, was coming from uh, the great financiers in the United States because we had to have an enemy to keep the conservatives, uh, the foolish uh, right-wingers in America, uh, from understanding what was really going on. And then, of course, Professor Quigley tells us on page 866 what is going to happen. Regardless of the outcome of the situation, it's increasingly clear that in the 20th century, the expert will replace the industrial tycoon in control of the economic system, even as he will replace the democratic voter in control of the political system. This is because planning will inevitably replace laissez-faire and the relationship between the two systems. Hopefully, the element of choice and freedom may survive for the ordinary individual and in that he may be free to make a choice between two opposing political groups, even if these groups have little policy choice within the parameters of policy established by the experts. In other words, you can vote for whoever you want to, but it doesn't make any difference because the same policy is going to be going on. And he may have the choice to switch his economic support from one large unit to another. But in general, his freedom and choice will be controlled within very narrow alternatives by the fact that he'll be numbered from birth and followed as a number throughout his educational training, his required military or public service, his tax contributions, his health and medical requirement, and finally retirement and death benefits. Little uh, wonder that somebody bought up Macmillan Company and destroyed the place of this book because the last thing they really wanted for was anybody to understand uh, what was going on in America. He talks about banking. This is page 325. Uh, this power of the Bank of England and its governors was admitted by most qualified observers. And he says in January of 1924, Reginald McKenna, who had been a Chancellor of the Exchequer in 1915-16, as chairman of the board of Midland Bank, told its stockholders, I'm afraid the ordinary citizen will not like to be told that banks can and do create money. And they who control the credit of the nation direct the policy of the government and hold in the hollow of their hands the destiny of the people. And on page 324, he makes this statement uh, basically about the pragmatic goals of financial capitalism had another far-reaching aim, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. This system was to be controlled in a feudalistic fashion by the central banks of the world acting in concert by secret agreements arrived at in frequent private meetings and conferences. The apex of the system was to be the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, a private bank owned and controlled by the world's central banks, which were themselves private corporations. Each central bank in the hands of men like Montague Norman of the Bank of England, Benjamin Strong of the New York Federal Reserve Bank, Charles Rist of the Bank of France, Heimar Schack of the Rice Bank, sought to dominate its government by its ability to control treasury loans to manipulate foreign exchanges, to influence the level of economic activity in the country, and to influence cooperative politicians by subsequent economic 
rewards in the business world. In other words, the best politicians that money can buy. And then, of course, he goes on to tell how these people backed Adolf Hitler. I encouraged Adolf Hitler at every turn. Uh, but these are the sort of things that the public weren't supposed to understand. Uh, they were to think that Adolf Hitler just sort of uh, came out of no place. What a fascinating book came out in 1972 called None Dare Call It Conspiracy, written by uh, Gary Allen and Larry Abraham, pointing out uh, that Khrushchev, uh, the leader of the Soviet Union, uh, the most powerful man in Russia, uh, until one weekend when Nelson Rockefeller went over for a visit to Russia, and the following week Khrushchev was managing a power plant in Siberia someplace, a hydroelectric plant, and people began saying, well, maybe the force behind Russian communism has nothing to do with Russia. Uh, maybe the force behind Russian communism really is in New York. 1975, this book came out, uh, Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler, pointing out of course that it was General Motors, General Electric, International Telephone and Telegraph, Ford Motor Company, uh, Chase Manhattan Bank, Exxon, uh, who built up Hitler's war machine. I have in my uh, records a letter from Ambassador Dodd, the uh, American ambassador to Germany during the 1930s, writing to, uh, to Colonel House. Everybody was writing to Colonel House. And, and he was saying, why is it that American corporations are building up Hitler's war-making material capacity? I mean, we just got through with a war. Nobody wants a war. Do the American stockholders know uh, that you can't get any money out of Germany because of the exchange controls? There's no profit to be made. Why are American corporations building up uh, the war-making capacity of Adolf Hitler? And of course, it's very simply because we were preparing for war. Now, uh, you can, of course, uh, read Wall Street and the Bolshevik Re Revolution uh, by Sutton going into the fact that we financed communism for its inception, national suicide going into the fact uh, that we financed the North Vietnamese all during the Vietnam War. Uh, we were giving money to Russia, $40 billion loans to Russia so they could provide the war material to the North Vietnamese to kill our boys. But you see, uh, the war in Vietnam really wasn't about Communism, it was about distracting the American people from the fact we were becoming a socialist nation. This is when the great society came about, the best enemies money could buy. Let me just take you quickly back to the murder on the Orient Express because uh, Monsieur Perrault finally decides uh, that there are 12 suspects, uh, there are 12 stab wounds in Mr. Ratchet. They all did it. Every one of them had a motive, and of course it was agreed upon that this very evil man was to be eliminated. And I'd like to suggest that most of the organizations we've talked about this evening are all involved in a worldwide movement to change the world, but most people have failed to recognize what the force was behind them. And so back in 1980, I went back to Georgetown University to try to figure out what was really going on. And I went through the papers of Professor Quigley to try to find out how he even knew there was a secret society, because if you read his book, you will never find out how he knew there was a secret society. And of course, I came across his letters to Professor Alfred Zimmern, and he basically had been told about the secret society by Professor Zimmern, who was part of the secret society. The following year, the book, The Anglo-American Establishment, came out uh, in which uh, Professor Quigley tells us that Zimmern was part of the uh, inner core of this secret society from 1910 to 1922, but in none of his written publications does Quigley ever reveal how he knew about the secret society. I know how he knew because I have all of his papers and his letters to Zimmern. And of course, Professor Quigley then tells us this. He says, one a wintry afternoon in February of 1981, and this comes from the Anglo-American establishment. Three men were engaged in earnest conversation in London, and from their conversations were to flow consequences of the greatest importance to the British Empire and to the world as a whole. For these men were organizing a secret society that was for more than 50 years to be of the utmost important, or be one of the most important forces in the formulation and execution of British imperial and foreign policy. And then, of course, he tells us in the Anglo-American establishment that the Rhodes Scholarships established by the terms of Cecil Rhodes' seventh will are known to everyone. What is not so widely known is that Rhodes in five previous wills left his fortune to form a secret society which was to devote itself to the preservation and expansion of the British Empire and what is, does not seem to be known to anyone is that this secret society was created by Rhodes and its principal trustee, Lord Milner, and continues to exist to this day. Well, 
we went to find out how we can document this. Uh, we came across a book that was written by William T. Stead. You'll have to understand that the Secret Society, the uh, four original members were Cecil Rhodes, William Stead, Lord Milner, and a man named Brett, who later became Lord Escher, uh, who was the senior advisor uh, to the monarchs of England uh, for 25 years, both the Queen Victoria and the various subsequent monarchs. Uh, and so the monarchy of Great Britain was in the hands of the Secret Society. Rhodes, pardon me, Stead was eventually thrown out of the secret society, and so he was quite willing to write about it. In his diary, he discussed it, and this comes from the book, uh, the, last, the Letters uh, of uh, William T. Stead by Francis White. And here he talks about, uh, he, he's describing what actually happened. Stead is telling about it because he's one of the o only people who ever came out of the society uh, and was actually thrown out of it. The talk centered presently upon the secret society of the elect, Rhodes liked that word, who were to bind themselves to work for the British Empire in the way in which the Jesuits worked for the Ch Church of Rome. And then he tells us, and let's just take the bottom uh, paragraph here, uh, I telegraphed for Brett, who came two hours later. We had a long talk, the net upshot of which the ideal arrangement would be, so far as we could see, Rhodes, the general of the society, Stead, Brett, Miller to be the hunter of three. After Rhodes, Stead to be general with a third, uh, possibly uh, Rothschild in succession behind them, Manning, the Booths, Little Johnston, Albert Gray, Arthur Balfour. Remember the name Arthur Balfour because it was a clue uh, to what Professor Quigley missed. Now, in, among Professor Quigley's papers, we found Rhodes' Confession of Faith. We have the original, and it's available to any of you who would like to see it. Uh, at least the original copy that, uh, that Professor Quigley had gotten uh, from Milner, who had gotten it from the Rhodes House at Oxford. But this is what Rhodes wrote. In the present day, I become a member of the Masonic Order. I see the wealth and power they possess, the influence they hold, and I think over their ceremonies, and I wonder that a, a large body of men can vote themselves to what at times appears the most ridiculous and absurd rites without an object and without an end. The idea gleaming and dancing before one's eyes like a will of the wisp at last frames itself into a plan. Why should we not form a secret society with but one object, the furtherance of the British Empire for bringing of the whole uncivilized world under British rule, for the recovery of the United States, for the making of the Anglo-Saxon race, but one empire? Well, uh, what of course really has been missed uh, is the fact that uh, Rhodes himself uh, had gone into masonry. Part, and then, of course, William Stead, who was one of the three original members of the society, uh, was not only into spiritualism, he was a disciple of Madame Blavatsky. And so we begin to see the occult foundations uh, of this organization that Rhodes was creating. But Lord Balfour, uh, who eventually became the Prime Minister of England, was deeply involved uh, with spiritualism and, of course, with the Society for Psychical Research. And what Quigley failed to realize, although this comes from page 31 and 32 uh, of his book, uh, is the influence of the occult on this whole movement to create a world government, because as Christians we recognize this is to become the government of the Antichrist. And so he's writing about uh, the various blocks in Great Britain, and there were power blocks within the aristocracy. One was the Cecil block, one was the Milner block, because uh, of course after Milner got control of all of Rhodes' wealth, great wealth, uh, he became a power in the English aristocracy. And Quigley writes, one of the enduring creations of the Cecil block is the Society for Psychical Research, which holds a position in the history of the Cecil block similar to that held by the Royal Institute of International Affairs and the Milner Group. The society was founded in 1882 by the Balfour family and their in-laws. In the 20th century, it was dominated by those members of the Cecil block who became most readily members of the Milner Group. Now, the uh, Society for Psychical Research, according to Dr. Quigley, Quigley, was made up of Englishmen who were interested in studying the occult and the supernatural. The society was formed of all people by Alfred Lord Tennyson's uncle, and Lord Tennyson, who wrote about the Parliament of Man and the Federation of the World, was a member uh, of this organization. Uh, of course, the stated goal of the Secret Society, the Round Table, and you can get their publications at any major library, was to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. But without God, man was going to accomplish this. The goal of the Council on Foreign Relations has always been to bring about a world government. Now, Cecil Rhodes had entered the Masonic Lodge. And when you enter the Masonic Lodge, 
uh, and take the first introductory uh, pledges. First of all, they blindfold you, they put a noose around your neck, they bury your left chest, you roll up your left pants leg, take off your left shoe, kneel before the altar, and of course, you, then you take these horrible oaths where you swear, if you ever reveal anything uh, that uh, you have heard why in the first uh, degree why they cut out your, take out, tear out your tongue, cut your throat, bury you in the sands of the sea up to the level of your neck at low tide so when the tide comes in you're dead if you're not already dead. Second degree, of course, they cut out your entrails and burn them and feed them to the birds of the air. Third degree, uh, they cut out your heart. I mean, it's, by the fourth degree, things are really pretty bad. Adult men <laughs> swear these oaths, but what you have to understand uh, is that as you're kneeling blindfolded uh, before the altar, before a Bible, the Holy Bible, uh, the worshipful master asks you, what do you desire? And you are told to answer the light. You have no idea what the light is, uh, but you answer the light. In the second degree, you're told to ask for more light. And the third degree, you want even more light. Uh, many of you here, I suspect, are born-again Christians, and you've, many of you have prayed the sinner's prayer, and when you pray the sinner's prayer, uh, something happens. Your, your life changes forevermore. I know this happened to me, and it's happened to many people, uh, but when the mason uh, swears this oath, something happens to him too, for he has requested the light to come in and dominate his life. Now, this is Albert Pike, the leading Masonic philosopher of the last century, and in his book, Morals and Dogma, which was given to every uh, Mason who advanced through the degrees uh, up until 1974, this was the Masonic Bible. And what Pike wrote on page 104, Masonry conceals its secrets from all the, except the adepts and the sages of the elect, and uses false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead those who deserve to be misled to conceal the truth which it calls light from them and to draw them away from it. In other words, you ask for the light, but we're not going to let you wouldn't know what the light is. On page 819, the blue degrees are about the outer court of the portico of the temple. Part of the symbols are displayed for the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretation. It is not intended that he shall understand them, for it is intended that he shall imagine he understands them. Their true explication is reserved for the adepts and the princes of masonry. He goes on to tell us uh, that on page 722, if you desire to gain admission to the sanctuary, we have said enough to show you the way. And if you do not, uh, it's useless for us to say more, as it has been useless for us to say so much. On page 781, uh, he tells you, if you reflect, my brother, you will no doubt suspect that some secret meaning was concealed in these words. But what's the secret meaning? The, on page 219, the right raises a corner of the veil, even in the degree of apprentice, for there declares that masonry is a worship. So what are they worshiping? Well, on pages 839 and 840, uh, of morals and dogma. And I'm just going to take the bottom paragraph because this is the important one. It was the remembrance of this scientific and religious absolute. The absolute is capitalized, reflecting deity. Of this doctrine that is summed up in a word of this word, capital W, deity. In fine, alternately lost and found again, that was transmitted to the elect of all ancient initiations. It was the same remembrance preserved, or perhaps profaned, in the celebrated order of the Templars that became for all secret associations of the Rosy Cross, that's the Rosicrucians, of the Illuminati, and of the Hermetic Freemasons, the reason of their strange rites, of their signs more or less conventional, and above all, of their mutual devotedness and of their power. In other words, if you get into these things, you will get power, power that you cannot believe and you will have great wealth, but at what cost? Well, when I went through Professor Quigley's papers, and uh, of course we found the interview with him uh, that we've already discussed, and if you get the interview, you'll actually hear him talking about these crazy right-wingers who come to him, and they show him that symbol, and they tell him that's the symbol of the Illuminati. And he says, that's not the symbol of the Illuminati, that's been around for 5,000 years. That's the symbol of the, uh, the, the mystery religions of antiquity, and that's what it really is. This is the symbol uh, of the mystery religions of Persia and Babylon and, and, 
and Egypt. Uh, this goes back to the ancient pagan religions, uh, which are the basis of all modern day secret societies. And every single one of them ties into this. Now, uh, you recall that we were talking about the Knights Templar. What were the Knights Templar? They were a religious order that in the um, oh, uh, about 1,000, 1,100 went on the Crusades, and they were to guard the temple, or where once it stood, Solomon's Temple, Temple Square, where today uh, the great mosque of al Mar is. But there, of course, they came in contact uh, with people who were part of the mystery religions. And they came back to Europe uh, in the 1200s. They became the most significant financial force in Europe. They became the bankers of Europe. And using a fractional reserve banking system, uh, all of the monarchies of Europe became indebted to them, just as governments today spend more than they have. So in those days, they spent more than they had. And the Templars dominated what was going on. But uh, of course, then it was discovered uh, that the Templars were Luciferian. And Jacques de Molay, their leader, uh, was burned at the stake in the early 1300s. Uh, of course, today, the uh, young people who are sons of, of Masons belong to the de Molays, as did uh, Bill Clinton. Let me read again uh, that final statement on page 840 of Morals and Dogma. It was the remembrance of this scientific and religious absolute, of this doctrine that is summed up in a word, of this word, and fine, alternately lost and found again, thus was transmitted to the elect of all ancient initiation. It was this same remembrance preserved, or perhaps profaned, in the celebrated order of the Templars that became, for all the secret associations of the Rosy Cross, of the Illuminati, of the Hermetic Freemasons, the reason for their strange rites, and of their signs more or less conventional, and above all, of their mutual devotedness and of their power. What is it about? Well, on page 321 of Morals and Dogma, uh, why uh, Pike lays it right out. Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears the light and with its splendors intolerable, blinds feeble, sensual, or selfish souls? Doubt it not. Why, it's simply Luciferianism. If you read Manly P. Hall's a book, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry, uh, he's very, very clear what it's about. When the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. That's what it's all about. It's Luciferianism and manifested in every aspect of our society today. Little wonder they want to take God uh, out of our schools. And a book called Spiritual Politics written by Corinne McLaughlin and Gordon Davidson, a very important book written by people who are involved in the occult. They will explain to you what it's really all about. J.P. Morgan, the great banker, of course, was into astrology. He said his astrology told him how to make his investments to make all of his money. Henry Ford was involved in the occult. Andrew Carnegie was involved in the occult. And Colonel House, the man who was able to control Clemenceau in Orlando and Woodrow Wilson in FDR and be able to go in the room and talk to people uh, and, of course, convince them uh, to take up his ideas. The man who was so intent upon uh, having communism survive when others wanted to do away with it, uh, he was one of the leaders of the occult movement. And, of course, this is why he left a copy of the protocols for those in the future uh, to uncover. And so we begin to see these patterns uh, unfolding. Let me read again what Manly P. Hall said, because this is so important. When the Mason learns the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. Uh, you can read the book, uh, the book of Revelation, uh, by Barbara Marks Hubbard. Uh, the original manuscript was actually uh, been, been somewhat altered. This book you can get at bookstores today. Uh, it tells about the coming horror that is going to occur in the mass extermination of people. Uh, this book was published by the Lawrence Rockefeller Fund for the Enhancement of the Humanities. But in the original text, which we have, uh, she says this. Now, this book is... Uh, is channeled to her, uh, and she readily admits that by what she calls the Christ light, but I believe is a demonic spirit. And she is rewriting the book of Revelation so you, if you are an occultist, can understand it. She quotes Revelation 6, 8, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and the beasts of the earth. 
And then she goes on to say, out of the full spectrum of human personality, one-fourth is electing to transcend with all their heart, mind, and spirit. One-fourth, however, is resistant to election. They were undetracted by life ever evolving. Their higher self is unable to penetrate the density of their mammalian senses. They can't be reached. They're defective seeds. Ladies and gentlemen, she's talking about you and me, those of us who worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we approach the quantum shift from creature human to co-creative human, the destructive one-fourth must be eliminated from the social body. Fortunately, you, dearly beloveds, are not responsible for this act. We are. We are in charge of God's selection process for planet Earth. He selects, we destroy, for we are the riders of the pale horse, death. Let's go on and just point out that this is a, a book written in about 1900 by Rudyard Kipling. And all of his books at that time had the swastika on the front. Remember, he wrote the eulogy to Cecil Rhodes. Of course, he himself was involved in the occult. That's an occult symbol. That's why Adolf Hitler used the swastika, because it was an occult symbol. Uh, of course, Harry Truman, who gave China and Eastern Europe to the communists, was a 33rd degree Mason. Winston Churchill, uh, who insisted on the invasion of Gallipoli and of North Africa to create the carnage that would justify a world government, was a Druid, entered the Druids in 1908, uh, was a third degree uh, Mason, and that's why he got along so well with FDR. Uh, Herbert, pardon me, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, who uh, was in office, uh, it didn't really matter whether the Democrats or Republicans were there. He was always in office. He was a 33rd degree Mason. That's how you get ahead in government. Let me take you uh, to the material I gave you a little earlier uh, from the Lucius Trust. And you remember I showed you this page before. Uh, where they were talking about meditation, letting in the light. Well, now you can know what the light is. Light is Lucifer. Let's go down to uh, the second Roman numeral, alignment. We project a light of lighted energy towards the spiritual hierarchy of the planet and the planetary heart, the great ashram of Sanat Kamara. Who is Sanat Kamara? We'll just change the letters around. It's Satan, of course. I mean, they're so openly and so blatant about it, but most people don't understand. Where does communism fit in this whole scenario? Well. Uh, Reverend Richard Wormbrand uh, was a Protestant minister living in Romania. He was arrested, put in prison, and tortured for 14 years to break his faith. Many of the ministers who were with him, of course, eventually broke. Many of them died in prison. When he finally got out of prison, he, he couldn't understand why they didn't just put him in prison. Uh, why did they want to break his faith? And so he began to study Karl Marx. And, of course, what he found out that Karl Marx, contrary to everything you've ever been led to believe, was not an atheist. And Karl Marx did not believe in socialism and communism. He was a Satanist, and he realized that socialism would destroy Western Christian civilization, which he hated. And that's why he embraced it, as did Proudhon and Bakunin and all of the other leading socialists at that time. They weren't socialists. They embraced socialism to destroy America. Of course, here you'll see the emblem of the Trilateral Commission. You look very closely. You'll three, three sixes joined together by an upside-down broken cross the Trilateral Commission created by David Rockefeller and Zygmu Brzezinski. We started our discussion today uh, with a poem from James Russell Lowell. And I want to give you the full text of that because it really lays out what this battle is all about. Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide. In that strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side, some new cause, some new messiah, offering each the bloom or bright. And the strife goes on forever, twixt the darkness and the light. Then to side with truth is noble, and to share her wretched crust, ere her cause brings fame and fortune, and is prosperous to be just. Then it is the brave man chooses, while the coward stands aside, until the multitudes make virtue of the faith they have denied. By the light of burning martyrs, Christ, thy bleeding feet we track, toiling up new Calvaries ever with a cross that turns not back. Though the cause of evil prospers, yet his truth alone is strong. Though her portion be the scaffold and upon the throne be wrong. But that scaffold sways the future, for in the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch above his own. And that's what it's all about. Martin Luther understood this, this battle when he wrote that great hymn that we used to sing in church. We don't sing it anymore. A mighty fortress is our God when he said, not, you know, for still our ancient foe doth cease to worketh woe. His power and craft are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Yeah. 
And St. Paul understood it uh, in, in Ephesians uh, 6.11 when he wrote, uh, for um, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this earth, against spiritual wickedness in, in high places. And the devil understood it because on the Mount of Temptation, he said to Jesus Christ, uh, why, uh, you know, if you'll simply fall down and worship me, all of these kingdoms on earth can be yours. But unfortunately, the modern church doesn't understand it. And our ministers tell us, oh, you're not to be involved in anything. Why, Romans 13 will tell you uh, that if you oppose what's going on in the world today, uh, why, of course, you're opposing the will of God. Now, at the beginning of this program, uh, I put on the screen uh, this emblem. And I want to tell you what it is. It appears at the top of page 839 of Morals and Dogma. And you will see uh, the... Um, compass and the square. Here's the compass, here's the square, Masonic symbols. Man and woman join together in one body. When they join together, of course, they create life, uh, just as God does. Uh, you see the symbols of men and women. On the opposite side, you see a uh, modified swastika and an altered cross. You see the symbols of light above, the sun and the moon, always symbols of light and of the occult uh, movement. But you see where their feet are standing while they're standing on the dragon, who is Lucifer, which of course overshadows the world. Now, every Mason has seen this. Most of them really don't understand it, you see. Uh, but why are their feet firmly planted on the dragon? Well, because the dragon is the basis of Masonry and of all the occult secret societies, Theosophy, Rosicrucianism, the Knight Templar, the Illuminati, they are all Luciferian. And yet, most people would look at that and never understand, because you see, throughout all history, uh, these secret societies have been used uh, to demonstrate the existence of the Luciferian movement, which dates back to the Garden of Eden. And time and time again throughout history, uh, we see it being played out in Cain and rebellion against God because he didn't like God's commandment that there had to be a blood, blood sacrifice. And so he kills Abel. Uh, we find it again at the time of Noah when Luciferianism had literally taken over the world and God had to destroy the world except for Noah and his family. Uh, we saw it uh, with Nimrod trying to unite all the world and build the temple of Babylon. Uh, we see the evil taking control in Sodom and Gomorrah. They of course, they had to destroy that completely. Uh, you hear that Joshua was told he was to kill everyone in, in, uh, in Jericho. Why? Why? Because they were sacrificing their children uh, to, to the gods. And uh, this is one thing God could not tolerate. Only uh, Rahab and, and her family were spared. Uh, they were to kill every living thing in Jericho because the evil had taken hold. But the tragedy is that evil has taken hold of our land today. And America is being used uh, to push this world government on all the rest of the world. This is what Desert Storm was about. This is what Kosovo was about. This is what Vietnam was about. This is what Korea, the First World War, the Second World War, all to bring about this world government. Well, now you know the secrets that have been concealed for people for so long. And of course, we hope that uh, you will become educated, begin to educate others to understand that we are not involved in a uh, political battle. We're not involved in an ideological battle. We're not involved in a cultural war. We're involved in a spiritual war that is being fought on a political and ideological and cultural battlefield. And it is our job uh, to be involved and to educate people as to what is happening. It was in 1838 when uh, Abraham Lincoln addressed the Lyceum in Springfield, Illinois, and he said this, at what point should we expect the approach of danger? By what means should we fortify ourselves against it? Should we expect some transatlantic giant to step the ocean and crush us with a blow? Never. All the armies of Europe and Asia and Africa combined could never by force uh, take a drink from the Ohio or make a mark on the Blue Ridge, not in a trial of a thousand years. That at what point should we expect the approach of danger? And I answer, if it ever reaches, it must spring up among us. It can never come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we ourselves must be its authors and its finishers. As a nation of free men, we shall live on through all time or die by suicide. And ladies and gentlemen, we're dying by suicide today. Let me quote, close with that quotation which is engraved in the marble behind uh, Thomas Jefferson's statue uh, in the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C. God, who gave us life, gave us liberty. 
But can the liberty of a nation be secure when the conviction has been forgotten that liberty is the gift of God? I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and his justice cannot sleep forever. Our job, first of all, is to pray as if it's up to the Lord and then to work as if it's up to us to educate people and to bring the truth uh, to as many people as we can in the time that we have left. Let me thank you for your attention and for being such a good audience. God bless you. All of America needs to hear that message. If all of America had that message, we wouldn't have such a mess. There's so many ways out of this, but it all boils down to the blessings of God. This past Sunday morning, I was walking out of the garage to get in the uh, car to go to uh, the church, and there was a fellow that had made arrangements to come by and, and do something, uh, some repairs at our house. And I obviously could not walk by him on a Sunday morning and not invite him to church. Even though it was obvious, obviously, he was not going to go to church that Sunday morning. So I turned to him and I said, um, I'd like to invite you to go to church. And he said, why? I said, because hell's hot and it's permanent. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, let's be honest with him. Hell's hot and it's permanent. And then he says, well, I know that's probably for some people. And I said, well, let's look at it this way. There's a heaven and there's a hell. And everybody that's been born is going to spend eternity in one or the other. I said, you ought to go to church so you can spend eternity in heaven, not hell. I mean, that's why we go. And he said, well, I know some people believe that way. And I said, well, let me encourage you to come to church so you can find out the truth for yourself and check it out. You need to investigate it. And I say, folks, tonight we have investigated what the devil is doing. We've investigated his tricks, his devices. And just like the mason, they put a noose around his neck, they bare one chest, they roll up one pant leg, take off one shoe, and they have him come in and kneel and take an oath to receive Lucifer. Now, as a Christian, if we want to receive Jesus, if we want to spend eternity in heaven rather than eternity in hell, it's as simple as this. We just have to take an oath to follow Jesus. But he wants us when we take that oath to take it and mean it and stick to it. Amen? All right, now, how do we get to heaven? How do we renounce if you've been, people may be watching the videotape, if you've been involved in some of this, if you've dabbled with the Ouija board, if you've played with uh, dowsing and some of the other occult things, how do we renounce some of that? And how do we get our sins washed away? How do we get our name written in the book of life? First of all, we have to realize is we cannot earn our way into heaven. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For it is by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift from God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We also have to understand that we're all sinners. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, we all deserve death. We all deserve that punishment. Now, how do we reach out and take that gift of life? How do we take that, that oath getting us the opportunity to go to heaven? Romans 10.9 and 10. It says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. What's it saying? It's simply saying it's not enough to believe it and not say it, and it's not enough to say it and not believe it. We've got to believe it, we've got to say it. And it's a commitment, folks. It's not just a little prayer that we're going to say today. And then we're going to go live like a devil tomorrow. Once you make that commitment, you don't backslide. You don't step back. You always march forward. You uh, continue to follow on in the footsteps of Jesus. Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, what's that word repent mean? Well, in my life, one time, having made a mess of my life, doing in my life what I wanted to do, and I think we've all been there, I sat down one day and I said, Lord, I made a mess of my life. I said, but I tell you what, I'll make you a promise. I'll make you a guarantee. I'll make a covenant 
okay? It's, it's not lightly made, and it's not easily broken. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you'll forgive my sins, if you'll give me another chance, from here on out, I promise I'm going to do my best to follow your laws. Does that mean I'm perfect? No, but it does mean my objective to be is to be perfect. No spot, no wrinkle. Live a holy life. That's our objective, all right? And I said, if you'll forgive my sins, I promise I'll read your book and I'll do my best to follow your laws. And my whole life turned around. Just like when that mason goes in, kneels down, takes that oath to receive Lucifer. His whole life turns around. <laughs> and the Christian, their whole life turns around. If you want your life to turn around, then you'll pray this prayer. Holy Spirit, I ask you to go out and knock on the hearts of the people right here in the audience and those people watching on the videotape that they'll not put this decision off. They'll make that decision right now and not make it easily, but make it a firm commitment from now on out that they'll make that decision and not put it off in Jesus' name. Now, you may be saying, I prayed that prayer. Well, I pray it every day. Let's all say it together. Everyone bow your heads, no one looking around. Let's say it together. Dear Heavenly Father, I admit I'm a sinner, and I confess with my mouth, and I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, died on the cross, arose three days later, I accept His blood to wash my sins away. Ask Him to write my name in the book of life. Keep me holy and save me in the day of trouble. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, unfortunately, there's folks that will tell you that's all you have to do is pray that little prayer and you're going to heaven. Well, that's not what my Bible says. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone that cries, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but those that doeth the will of the Father. All right? In other words, you have to follow on. He says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. He says, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So it's only the first step in a journey that ends only when we get to see him, all right? Also, it's not over in another way because Matthew 10, 32 and 3 says, Whosoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father, which is in heaven. Whosoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Now, what he's wanting us to do is to stand up before a group of people and say with our mouth, Jesus is Lord. Now, ask yourself this. If you can't stand in a Christian meeting in front of Christians and say, Jesus is Lord, how sure is your Christianity? How sure is your salvation? And if you can't do it here, how are you going to do it in the shadow of the guillotine? Come on. Right? Okay. It's a good first step is all it is. Now, here's the way we're going to do this. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, first time you prayed that prayer a minute, first time you asked Jesus to come in your heart, first time you asked to be saved, would you raise your hand? Just raise your hand. Okay, all right. Now, if you prayed that prayer, rededicating your life, saying, I've slipped in the past, but boy, from here on out, I'm going to make a new commitment to follow God's laws. Would you raise your hand? Amen. Good, good. I see you. I see you. All right. Now, if you raise your hand in either group, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to come up front. This is not about being embarrassed. This is about fulfilling Matthew 721 or... Uh, 10, 32, and 3, so you can confess with your mouth to a group of people that Jesus is Lord. If you raise your hand in either group, would you just please stand at your chair? Okay, hold your applause. Anyone else want to join them? And I have one question for those people standing. And that question is, who's your Lord and Savior? Lord Jesus Christ. Ma'am? Jesus 